so let's go for it. I can't do my thing plug in. Good morning, everybody. It's August 11th, 2020, and it's 10 a.m., and this is the meeting of the Story County Board of Supervisors, originating from our administration building, and uh, we're providing public access via Zoom this morning. So I will hereby call our meeting to order and ask if anybody could join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody. Um, <coughs> I stated where we're providing um, our public access via Zoom, and that's because um, that's consistent with Section 21.8.1 of the Code of Iowa, and it's because of the continuing COVID-19 pandemic and needing to provide social distancing. Um, the next thing on the agenda is adoption of the agenda. As I think everybody knows, we had some very significant weather yesterday here in Story County and throughout Central Iowa and Central U.S. And, and there are some things that I think are, were some of the items on the agenda were contingent upon other groups meeting and those groups haven't met. So I'd like to go through the agenda and ask for any, uh, and maybe update, maybe um, suggest some changes before we approve the agenda. Um, the first one would be um, under 13, public hearing items one, um, the conservation and, and 14 one. The conservation board was supposed to meet last night, but because of disruptions with telephone service, et cetera, did not have a meeting. And um, Mike Cox, the director of conservation, is here today. He's he's made a request, and I'll just tell um, him if it's okay, Mike. I'll just tell him what your request is, and then if anybody has any questions, we'll see where we go on it. Um, the first one is public hearing item consideration of part of Iowa Nature Trail Slater Connection final plans, and it's just specifications for the bids. And and Mike asks if we would be willing to consider approving that contingent upon the conservation department approving it later this week. And it needs to be republished if we, because it's a public hearing, if we don't approve it. So that's the request there. And the second request is the consideration of Hickory Grove Park resurfacing. And that is a bid. Um, and that you think you might have the conservation board able to meet before Friday to consider that and bring their recommendation back to you. Correct. So that item 14.1, we might consider putting on because we have talked about doing a special meeting this Friday and we've cleared our calendars for it. So if that's, um, if that's amenable to people, if you're okay with that, we can take 13.1 and, and consider that contingent on conservation and 14-1, we could defer until Friday. Any thoughts on that? Those two before I go on to one other item. I'm fine with 14-1 being deferred to Friday. 13-1, the barrier is already been published. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and it would come back to us again. That and it have to be republished. Yeah, republished. Republish. Republish. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, then I don't have a problem necessarily with 13-1 either as long as the conservation board's meeting again. We'll yeah. be meeting yet. Yeah, and I, I have, I'm fine with that and any motion that we make would be contingent on the conservation board. And then I'll go on, thank you, and on the 14-3, which is discussion and consideration of draft letter to DOT from board to give comments on interchange options on Highway 30 near Nevada. And, um, the Nevada City Council was going to meet last night and they also had to postpone their meeting because of the uh, severe weather and they are meeting Thursday evening and the mayor and the city administrator did want to originally said they would like to zoom in on our meeting today and I don't think they have because they're out turning damage is what I was told when I called over there but uh, I, I left a message that we might consider not doing this item until Friday 
just to see, you know, where they were on it. So we could also defer uh, item 14, three to Friday, if that's, I mean, if that's um, acceptable. I don't really have a problem with that. I think uh, the letter that we've got as a draft is pretty clear from our position, but they would like an opportunity to weigh in and they are the community affected. So um, if we push that back, to Friday, I think that's best in allowing everybody to have their voice. I'm fine with that as well. Okay, we'll turn that one to Friday. And um, the other item we have is, I'm not sure about, under um, 14 additional items, item eight, and we may decide later, that's um, regarding the face coverings issue. We might decide to continue that discussion on Friday if we so just 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 a statement right on that that we might add that to a Friday agenda. So the changes in the agenda that I'm suggesting would be um, the two the protection of conservation and the Nevada the Highway Thirty with a possible for yeah. Number eight, yes. pending. Mm -hmm. we well, but number eight, we're going to address. It's just how far we get in the addressing yeah. of it. That is really is the difference. So we're addressing at some fashion number eight today. Yeah. So, um, so I would move um, approval of the agenda with the um, discussion of pulling item uh, fourteen three. It is moving that along. And fourteen one. And fourteen one. Uh, is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? It's Olson, oh, I'm sorry. Olson, yes. I will send Kevin's eye, Merck, and I. I'm just trying to make it up. It depends which board you're chairing. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. That's what happens. You can all hope that's this one. Thank you for understanding. Sure. Okay. The other thing I just want to ask, um, maybe the boards and golf zones, we've got some uh, staff members here. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a very severe weather event yesterday, and I wonder if we might at some point just allow them to give us a little brief verbal update on what's happened. Yes, and as a matter of fact, I'd just like to point out that while it's not on the agenda, um, at the time, once before, it's been four years ago, I think, but the Board of Supervisors got an emergency update per allowed under an exemption in Iowa code. It was when we had the big Stover fire and, and uh, we had emergency responders and, and the Bay and right away to give us an immediate update on that. So I'm perfectly comfortable and I think that's very appropriate. We hear what we can today and then um, maybe even on Friday we'll have a, a, a follow up update. So why don't we do that then? Maybe we can do that after item six. Okay. That's all right. Sure. Okay. Super. Um, okay, so item six then is updates on COVID-19. Are there any updates from staff? Hearing none, any updates from supervisors? The only data information I have is from the website. It looks like there were four additional deaths up to 935 and 182 new positives <laughs> statewide. Story County had two additional positives and no changes in hospitalization or um, deaths. They do say on the state website though that some numbers, because of the storm, mm -hmm. um, uh, that things will be updated at a later date and seeing some of the hospitalizations, some patients had to be treated elsewhere and so that's <coughs> not reflected. It, it's, it may look a little skewed for the next few days or whatever. <laughs> the other issue there, I think, and it's one that we've brought up, is that um, it doesn't seem like the numbers from Iowa State are making it out to the IDPH right. website because they it was last week they had their first their first uh, was it 66 out of a little over 3,000 or 2.2 percent and 2.2 percent isn't a very large number when you you know you look at the percentage but when you look at the number of people returning to AIDS it does end up being a pretty large number. And I've had a chance um, 
to ask Iowa State if they know why those numbers aren't being reflected in Story County's numbers. Because what I understood is half the students decided to stay here and isolate in the dorm. And they're still not, I mean, if they went home, they don't know if they're coming back, maybe I could see that, but that they're here or they're isolating, but they don't show up in IDPH numbers is, is troubling. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Um, the uh, Judge Bethany Curry, uh, who had, who chairs the uh, Courthouse Security Committee and also then chaired the subgroup, the League Planning Committee, to look at the reopening of the courts. Um, she reached out and asked uh, all of the participants in the planning committee if they had any feedback now that the courts had started uh, with non-jury trials. And uh, public defender Paul Rounds responded. And he has a couple of concerns. And um, he one concern he has is that the honor system to identify clients and other people of, uh, that may be involved with the court um, saying voluntarily if they've been exposed or if they have a fever, et cetera, he feels it's not working very well. Uh, those clients who, who uh, may be well, who are not uh, eager to come to court for some reason, say that they've been exposed. Conversely, um, those people who are eager to come to court, even if they're running a fever, are saying they're fine. So he actually had, uh, in this uh, kind of communication has said it's the government's responsibility to see that everybody's safe and the county should be paying to, to do the monitoring. And Judge Curry actually responded back saying neither the courts nor Story County have that kind of money. I responded back asking him if he thought a possibility would be if Story County looked at purchasing some no contact thermometers and gave them to the clerk of court for use by the attorneys. I mean, I, I can't solve his issue entirely, or we can't, okay? But I just asked if that was an option. Haven't heard back yet. The other thing that he was uh, uh, concerned about um, is, I, I don't know much about this, and I said to him responding that, I don't understand about the face, uh, the actual, those face shields, but apparently some judges are requiring them for people who testify or something. I don't know exactly, but they're being required. And he pointed out that public defenders, and you know, and I'm going to include legal aid myself. Those type, those people probably don't have money to go out and buy face shields. Okay, so what I said to him is, yes, we had agreed to share the cost of the disposable face masks. We had done that because we also have people going into the justice center, taking them and needing them for us also. I said, if you want to provide more information about why these face shields are actually being required, how many you thought you might need or whatever, I could ask the supervisors if we would do like a small one-time grant or something, and then you guys would be responsible, whatever. So I just wanted to let you know that those are the logistic issues or that he's seeing from the standpoint of representing um, uh, the people who don't have a lot of just giving you an update. I have not heard back from him or, and I asked the rest of the planning committee to weigh in on this also. You know, what do you guys think? Just letting you know, that's it for me. Okay. Uh, moving on then, uh, emergency updates. Could we start with the sheriff? Would you be willing to give us a brief update? <coughs> Certainly. Good morning, board. Good morning. Um, everything uh, kind of hit us by surprise yesterday, like I, I imagine it hit everybody in Iowa. And uh, then wide devastation, uh, not only in Story County, but in surrounding counties and other places as well. Um, I think the community uh, deserves a pat on the back. As soon as the storm was over, we were going around and seeing the neighbors and everybody out trying to clear debris and get everything off the road. The sheriff's office has um, uh, utilized uh, our uh, MRAP uh, that we have, uh, the big heavy piece of machinery. Uh, we had two areas in Roland that we cleared. They had uh, large trees down in one uh, street, and we used the MRAP to pull that out. And the deputies cut it up and got it off, and then the fire department up there asked us to go to another location 
where one big tree was blown over onto a second big tree and they both fell on a house. Mm -hmm. So we went over and we were able to put the winch on the, uh, the first tree and pull it off and they got it sawed up and hauled away and then we winched off the second one and uh, everyone there was appreciative of that. We were then called to 620th and 200th for a large uh, tree uh, blocking the road there. And uh, on our way down, uh, we came across so many power lines that were down. We were unable to get past them and to get to that location. And at that point, <clears throat> um, I was given the word that uh, the secondary roads had decided to close those roads until they could be made safe. And so um, you know, we backed out of there and uh, I don't think we had any other calls for service for the MRAP after that. Uh, we happened to have ERT training day yesterday, so that gave us about 14 additional deputies that were available. We reassigned them and repurposed them to patrol, and after uh, uh, that, we started handling the numerous calls once the storm had let up enough for us to uh, go out and respond, and we started taking care of the most urgent first and then trying to get back to calls for service. Uh, our staff had worked, we put a deputy in each of the communities uh, that we do contract law enforcement for. And so they were visible, people could see them if they needed anything. And we did that till about oh, seven or eight last night. After that, um, most of the deputies then were uh, allowed to go and we kept at least, there was at least five on duty. And today we're hopefully we're getting back to normal um, operations. We have one of our drones uh, that have come in and uh, we're looking at putting that up to see today to see uh, for two purposes. One, to get a little training and usage uh, for the operator. And number two, we want to fly over some areas and see if we can get some damage assessment and, and look to see what, uh, what that would look like, especially for uh, uh, future cases that we might be using that for. Uh, so with that said, Nick or Connie, is there anything else? Nope, you covered it well. Very good. Okay. okay. So, board, that would be my report. Any questions? Uh, just thank you very much. Um, no fatalities, no injuries. Nope. Just we came out of it very lucky. You know, people in Story County, like I said, deserves hats off to them. Uh, everybody pulled together. And again, I can't say enough about my crew. Dispatch was immediately overwhelmed. And uh, we assigned two other people in there to help with dispatch. And then uh, Connie and the crew, we tried to set up our phone bank, which we found out, you know, whenever you have an emergency, you always find another glitch, you got to work out. <laughs> so we did that. But everybody at the sheriff's office pitched in and uh, did everything we could during the storm. And as soon as the storm subsided, everybody was out, spread out throughout the county, helping and doing what they could where they could. So. Thank you very much, okay. and thank you to all your staff. You did an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, do you want to go now and just give a little update since we're sure. Uh, well, thank you to uh, sheriff and, and uh, sheriff staff for for doing what they do so well. Also, emergency management staff, all of our fire and rescue staff. Uh, <laughs> Uh, did really well, so thank you to everyone. Uh, yeah, this was very, uh, very unexpected. Uh, as far as our um, parks and facilities, uh, we did an initial damage assessment yesterday. Um, we don't have any structural damage. Uh, we do have some infrastructure damage at Dakin Slate to electrical infrastructure and the such. Um, and extensive tree damage, as you can imagine. No, uh, just like the sheriff said, no injuries. Um, everyone's safe. Um, campers at Hickory Grove um, Campground were uh, um, sheltered in the storm shelter there. Um, were maintained in that shelter until staff determined it was clear to release them from the shelter. Um, so that worked well. Uh, Dakins Lake Campground, we did have campers there. Uh, the campground host was able to make contact with all of them prior and took them to um, shelter in the city of Zeering. Um, so that went well there. Um, Leanne has a couple pictures here for you to uh, see what happened at Dakins Lake. We had 10 campers there, uh, 10 mm -hmm. RV campers, all but two of them uh, were significantly damaged. Uh, 
um, two remained upright. Um, all the others were, um, uh, were knocked over. This particular one you're looking at, that was the damage trail and that camper moved probably uh, 300 feet. Wow. Um, so significant damage and, and that's what generated electrical um, damage to electrical pedestals up there, et cetera. So um, Nakins Lake is uh, shut down right now. It will be for some time until we get the, the uh, debris removed and, and the, the electrical infrastructure addressed. Is there one more maybe? And there's the other one. So significant <laughs> damage, but uh, again, um, counter blessings that everyone was uh, evacuated and safe. So thanks to um, our staff and to the campground host up there for um, for making that so. So that's best work. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. That came up um, so very very quickly. Yeah, it did. Uh, and so we're we're still doing uh, damage assessment. Like I said, kind of a first blush assessment is is complete. Um, but uh, we have made the decision because there is so much um, debris in the parks and we're going to be out there removing debris and trees and that we have four, as of right now, we're closing all of the county parks uh, until we can get a better handle of what's out there and get some of the initial debris removal done and get a better assessment. So at the moment, we've got too many uh, moving parts out there in the parks and, and uh, it's just not safe. So um, we hope to get a better assessment and uh, get the uh, get some parks back open back open by the weekend. So any questions? I was driven by Peterson last night and I saw a car going in and that kind of gave me pause and I thought, well, thanks for bringing that up. I said, oh, I hope people aren't going in the parks because we don't know what's what the situation is now. And Correct. I know it was a staff person or a member of the public, but yep. I'm glad they're closed. Good. Any other questions for Mike? Thank you. Okay. And thank your host and thank your, yes. um, your staff for the quick work of keeping everybody safe. Very good. Thank you. I see that we have Darren Boone and uh, Darren had given the supervisors a little bit of an update yesterday, but Darren, I might ask you if you would be willing to just take a minute since you've had crew out there on the roads and tell sure. us what current is and what's been going on. Sure. Uh, to follow up with Mike and the sheriff there, yeah, we've, I don't think we've ever seen it quite widespread damage as this. So uh, we have nearly a thousand miles of roads to maintain. So uh, we were able to get almost all the roads open from debris wise. We just shoved it off the road into the ditch. Um, the stuff we could not get open is because I had power lines me mixed in with it. So we were starting to get some of those road closures put up on our road closure map on our website. And majority of those are gonna be the power line issues and that we can't do much with them until the power lines are out of the way. Um, like I said, widespread. So we're gonna be picking up debris for months probably. Um, a lot of sign damage. So anybody traveling the rural areas, uh, use extra caution. There's going to be a lot of debris pushed in the ditches and signs down, hundreds of signs down. So we're going to hit the high priority signs first, stop signs, and then work out from there. Um, but there'll be a lot of curved signs, no passing signs that won't get uh, replaced for a while here. Um, I'm not sure we have en enough posts in stock. Uh, to get them all right away. We're uh, looking into that right now. Uh, but uh, that's that's the main message right now. It's it's going to take some time to clean up because it's so widespread. Any questions for Darren? None. Thank you. And again, thank for, thanks for, to your crews out there. And uh, it's hard work. It's tough work. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Yes, I'm glad you got those roads closed so quickly when the power lines are down. <coughs> Thank you much. Pass our thanks on to everybody. Is there anybody else, uh, any other uh, department heads who got something they'd like to report on? We'll just give you a second if you do. Joby, maybe the bill, our buildings. That might be a good thing to hear about. 
Yeah, I was trying to get myself unmuted. We didn't, most of our buildings didn't sustain any serious structural damage. In our group homes, we lost some fence panels, a lot of tree limbs down. We're working on getting that cleaned up. We still have some properties without power. The Justice Center is still currently running off generator backup. Fuel level on them generators is good. We could sustain another probably three days at the fuel level we have now, but we anticipate on refueling either this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, our three group homes, none of them have power right now. Um, Coordinating with the tenants, making sure we can get them what they need, um, watching the critical systems, you know, making sure that they work. Uh, the admin building never lost power. It lights flickered a bunch yesterday, but it stayed on. Human Services Center in Ames, it was without power until about midnight last night and it came back on, but it's also a full generator backup building. So building itself stayed running, but nobody around us had power. Uh, the McFarland Park facility is still without power. We're working on trying to get their keyless entry system running off of either one of our portable generators or one that uh, the conservation staff has. So I got a couple of guys working on that right now so that we can still get in and out of the building using our FOB system. Uh, the animal shelter has power. Um, trying to think. Engineers complex. I, I know the engineers building's got power. I think the whole complex is in good shape. Darren could probably answer that better than I could. But a lot of cleanup. Not like what Rhodes has got to deal with, but a lot of tree limbs. That's kind of a quick overview of what I got going on. Very useful. And then questions for Joby. <clears throat> thanks for everything, Joby. I agree. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Thanks on to your staff, too. Um, anybody else who's got anything of significance to report? Jerry Moore, I know you've been down at the Emergency Operations Center, but you're just kind of in an assessment mode right now, I understand. So, um, if there's anything in particular. Uh, yes, this is Jerry, Planning and Development. Um, yeah, Keith and, and Melissa uh, were awesome in uh, giving us direction yesterday, um, but for the most part, we were just um, taking the information as it came in and getting it on our county system for those within our network uh, to learn about where the issues were, where the incidences were, with the blockages, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of the roads, with the trees and the power lines being down. And we are also assisting individuals in, um, you know, that had damage to their homes and that uh, they were not able to uh, stay in those homes last night. So we were helping uh, make connections with the Red Cross uh, for lodging. And, and so I think probably today and the next few days will be, um, you know, trying to provide information and assistance on um, like debris, debris management. That's basically all I have. Okay. Any questions for Jerry? No. Okay. Thank you, Jerry, for being down there and helping out there and all good information. And um, anybody else who's got anything? If not, we will move on to public comment number one. This comment period is for the public to address topics on today's agenda. And I will open the public comment period and ask if there's anybody, members of the public, and if you hear something, you may unmute yourself and raise your hand if you are able to do that. Okay, we'll do it that way. Uh, is it Galen Wilkie? Yes, Ga Galen? yes, it's Galen, thank you. Uh, well, thank, first, thank, thank you for having this public comment opportunity. And uh, 2020 is not 
the best year. I think uh, it's not a year we're going to remember well. But um, I did want to uh, again share my concern. I was at the uh, Story County Board of Health meeting uh, with the level of contact tracing related to COVID in Story County. Uh, contact tracing is the foundation for the control of epidemics. It's how Ebola, SARS, and MERS were brought under control. And two of the three of those are coronaviruses. Uh, it's how Taiwan, New Zealand, and Vietnam, uh, countries that have managed COVID-19 very well, uh, have been successful. Uh, the Board of Supervisors has weighed in on a number of COVID issues, uh, uh, it, such as whether or not the the governor should have a shelter in place order, whether there should be football fans in the stadium. And I suspect whether communities should have a mask mandate. But all of these are really outside your direct control or responsibilities. Uh, contact tracing is right in your wheelhouse. It is within your control. It, it is our responsibility here in Story County through Story County Public Health. Um, I couldn't get or find a precise consensus number but most suggestions say we should have about 15 contract tracers per 100,000 population. And that's about the population of Story County. We have only three to my knowledge and I might not be completely up to date. Uh, the university has recruited and trained 50 contact testers uh, to cover the, the 6,000 plus residence hall students. Um, and you know, I would add that the local contact tracers are always gonna be more effective than uh, Iowa Department of Public Health uh, or the National Guard. Neither of these provide much transparency or information about the, the measurements for the success of their programs uh, or any idea how long it's taking or, or the, the percent of, um, of new cases from the existing population of contacts. These are just common measures of effectiveness. Uh, uh, local contact tracers are more effective at establishing rapport with contacts and cases uh, and are more likely to be successful in achieving um, isolation and quarantine uh, of the cases and contacts um, that will help stop the spread of this dreadful virus. Uh, they would also be better positioned to help uh, cases and contacts with things like food deliveries and others in this world of contact tracers. Uh, go uh, face to face, um, of course, the right distance and a mask and everything. But I would urge you to to not lose sight of this. Uh, and uh, I would really like to see it be a major initiative. I, I just don't see how with all the people arriving uh, in Ames, uh, this is going to be kept under control. I, 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 I'm not an um, epidemiologist, but it just looks like uh, we're setting ourselves up for a a very difficult situation. So uh, thank you for listening and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Do uh, either of the other supervisors have any comments or questions for Mr. Wilkie? I don't at this time because I know that uh, uh, Galen has emailed me a couple times on the topic and uh, spoke before the Board of Health meeting that we just just had. So my, I guess my comment, thanks Galen, I heard you speak on last Friday's Board of Health uh, conference call and I was a, a guest there. Um, my thought or connection here is that it would be the Story County Public Health Department who would be taking this back, but you're coming to us because you see this as us be the funding source, correct? I mean, that's the bottom that, line. That's right, I don't think that, I I, I don't think they're funded to do anything more than they're doing right now. And I'm, I'm not sure I can trace everything, but but according to the website, they report to the Story County Board of Health. And, and I think that funding is is from you guys. Right. Correct, right. But, and they're not doing but, any contract tracing or almost none right now because the National Guard is doing it. Okay, I just want to make sure that, because there are other people who may be listening who haven't followed this as closely or, or as be as knowledgeable that that's why you're really approaching us, is we, would, we couldn't force it to happen or require it to happen. We can, however, could be a funding source for it if it came back locally. So we'll contact her. Well, like, like any of like any other thing you said, Finn, I just can't see a National Guardsman 
from wherever they are. Not that they're they're not well trained people, but I just can't see them calling an Iowa State student who's been a close contact of a case and saying you're you really should uh, quarantine yourself and not leave your room for the next 14 days. I I don't think they're going to be effective, and and that's that's the the main issue here. Uh, I think a, a local person calling and and they should be called back every day. Um, you know, it's an intense activity, but it's the way you control these things. Galen, we appreciate your comment. Very good information, and we'll take it in. We will probably be considering it. Thank you. Are there any other public Thank you. comments? Thank you, Galen. Is there anybody else who'd like to make a comment? Leanne, do you see any hands raised? Okay, if not, I will close public comment session number one. We'll go on to discussion and consideration of items brought before the board with requests for immediate action. And I don't believe there are any. Does anybody have any? Then moving on, agency reports, we have none. Consideration of minutes of the August 4th, 2020 meeting. I would entertain a motion for approval. Oh, no minutes. There aren't minutes? Mm -hmm. No. Sorry. Oh, you're right, there aren't minutes. Never mind, we do not have minutes for approval. Excuse me. We will go on then. Uh, consideration of personnel actions. I would entertain a motion for approval of personnel actions as listed. So moved. Second. Evans? Aye. Olson? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Approved. We'll go on to consent agenda. Is there anything to be pulled? Yes, I'd like to pull item one, consideration of authorizing one additional deputy sheriff position to the staff of the sheriff's office. Okay, then I would entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda with the exception of item one, which we dealt with separately. I would so move. Second. Olson? Aye. Kevin? Aye. Merkin? Aye. Consent agenda is approved with the exception of item one. And then we'll go on to item one, consideration of authorizing one additional deputy sheriff position to the staff of the sheriff's office. Supervisor Olson? Um, I pulled this because it was on our agenda a couple months ago and we had already dealt with this and said no, that uh, we wanted needed to head toward the beginning, the first of the year. So the sheriff contacted me, I suspect all of you, okay, to say that he was bringing it back. So I'm gonna invite the sheriff up here to talk about what has changed Thank you. The uh, <clears throat> issue I guess we're looking at, nothing has really changed. What I wanted to come back in front of the board about <clears throat> was is number one, this is not a conflict with the board's hiring freeze. I am not asking uh, to hire the deputy immediately. I'm asking to authorize the position which is what we discussed in the board work session uh, last January, and then the board authorized in the public hearing uh, later on. And again, the amount of work that goes in to asking for a position is not something that next year we can come back and just say, oh, we want it because my staff has to go back and research. We have to contact other communities, other counties, it takes a lot of work to bring this proposal back together. We have to look at cost for what everything costs from equipment to training uh, that goes along with the uh, hiring of a person. And I would like the board to consider, say if we had a uh, deputy that left and uh, instead of just refilling this, the board would say things are a little tight right now, would you hold off on hiring? Well, of course I would. But that doesn't mean the board would take that position away from me. I would still have that position. And when the board felt comfortable that we could hire at that time, that's where we would do that. This is a, uh, in my request, I stayed in here, just like I did the first one, that uh, once the COVID-19 pandemic has subsided and the Board of Supervisors has the opportunity to review the county's financial situation, and feels comfortable moving forward with the hire, I will then fill the position. Um, I think this is uh, very much in line with what we've done in other hiring practices uh, throughout my tenure here. Uh, when doing this, I also reached out and talked with Lisa Markley and with Alyssa Wignall uh, regarding this. 
And I don't know if any of them would have anything they would care to say, but I asked the Board of Supervisors respectfully to please reconsider my request for the position, not the immediately bringing on the position, and that will still remain under the Board's control under my uh, agreement. I'm a little confused about some of the steps you say if we don't authorize the position, you would have to take it. It almost sounds like you're saying you would need to submit another budget request next year. And I don't believe that's the case, is it? Alyssa, do you know? You have to talk about it in budget next session. Exactly. So we would talk about it in the budget yeah. next session. Yeah, even okay. though it was funded, they, they, they come to the board and approve the anything. Well, but there is a reason that it exists, is that they're two separate parts. Because yeah. the budget's done very early, right? We did the budget pretty much pre-COVID, with the exception of the actual vote at the end, all mm -hmm. right, and stuff. So, which hence is causing all of this. Um, so, yeah, I was confused a little bit too about what other steps would have to be taken, because you you had already laid out about for us at previous budget time. Couldn't you just bring those back about you know how many uh, the hours, etc. My one of my thoughts, and I believe I said this a couple of months ago, was that we actually were asked for many positions. Was it 11 total at budget time? And um, among everybody, not just yes. you, but everybody. Yeah, <laughs> to comply like you were going to double the course. Okay. Um, but so we put, we ended up funding three. We let, and those, but we said, that um, nobody could hire. The hiring freeze was for nobody to mm -hmm. hire a new position, right? That's what it is. So if we do yours, then we're kind of saying yes to the other two positions, but we have no idea still where COVID impact is gonna end up. So once again, we're premature and it's quite possible that as well, we know one thing that happens when the budget discussions go forward in January is we take a look at where the county is now. I mean, that's the next kind of time for this. So I'm still not clear why you feel the board needs to do this now as opposed to the board that will be sitting in January would be the ones to say, to, to approve not only yours, but the other two positions. I, I don't, I still don't get why now. To me, there is a separation of the, of the two issues here. Okay. One, Loris, is if I was here asking to fill a position or to be given the position and allow me to fill it immediately, that is not what I'm asking. As I mentioned earlier, if I had a deputy that uh, left and I could bring that, just bring in another person to fill that position, but the board would say, please wait, we, we're kind of tight right now. I would wait, but the board would not take that position away from me. We'd just wait until that position could be filled. Merely, that's all I'm asking right now. I'm asking for the position to be authorized because the point you bring up, Loris, is next budget season, there's gonna be a new board here. And as I have a new board then, then from my organizational standpoint, I start all over again. And the other counties, they're gonna have shifted a little bit. Their budgets are gonna have shifted a little bit. Costs are gonna have shifted. So everything that I did to come to the board to ask for the position, I then have to go back my staff and redo the entire, and that takes some time, a considerable amount of time to do. And by the board giving me the uh, position now, I'm authorized the position, but I have in writing to the board that only the board can fill that position. I'm very respectful of the hiring freeze that the board has implemented here to see where things are going. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not arguing with that at all. I'm just asking, please give me the position in my office. And then later, should the board feel comfortable, at that time, the board can give me the authorization to fill the position and I won't fill it until then. So you're saying kind of a two prong proposal. One is authorizing the position and then at a later date, coming forward to say, we would like to fill the position, whether you do it through the exceptions that we have with that still in place, or, but regardless, you come before the board another time, just so that I'm clear, before filling a position. Even if the hiring freeze is no longer in effect. 
No. Correct. Where, whenever that is. And then the board can say, we'll bring you back up to your, or we'll bring you up to your authorized positions. But even in here, I, again, I state um, that once the COVID pandemic has subsided and the Board of Supervisors has the opportunity to review the county's financial situation and feels comfortable moving forward with the hire, I will then fill the position. I am not going to hire this person until the board gives final approval to hire the position. Yeah. I am asking merely for the position. See, and here's where I think it's a little awkward. It almost sounds like there's a general hiring freeze, but then you're also agreeing to a specific hiring freeze on this position that would be separate from the general hiring freeze. I don't know how to put it any other way. That's what I'm kind of hearing. I'm actually hearing it a little differently, I think. If, if I'm understanding correctly, is is he's wanting the position that we discussed back in January, and I know we voted on. I, I, that's why I was specifically asking the two prongs. The other prong would be it's still a hiring freeze. The sheriff would not be hiring that person because we're still under a hiring freeze, but gives him the opportunity to come forward and ask for the exception to the hiring freeze to fill a position that we have then, we've already um, given him the option for, if I'm understanding that so correctly. So we've not voted for the position and, I, and that's, and that's why, why in my, as I kind of watched this coming in as an outsider, if you will, okay, four years ago, that it seems like once that position exists, is given the blessing of the board, okay, for the actual, yes, we have now created it, not just put in the budget, because the budget's always a moving target anyway, sure. right? Sure. That it's very hard to remove that position. Is it not, Alyssa? We've got unions involved, and and somebody can't be just laid off without certain things. I mean, I and that's part of what I'm looking at too, is logistically. Of course, you can pull the budget. Yeah. <laughs> that's how the personnel is by budget. So while they still have the authorized position, the board has to authorize the position to elect an officer. This is just so very clear. Right. So they can't go and create a position and fill it even if they have excess budget numbers. That's why we come to the Policing Board and Board. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, the board can still do budget because we have forced elected officers to reduce staff. That's how reduction is staff. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. So that has happened in my tenure in, as sheriff as well, where uh, we had to reduce a number of uh, people on staff to get through the budget year. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying. Can that. you explain something for me, Alyssa? Sure. I, I have never worked any place before where we had this kind of two-step process. Usually, if a position was approved in a budget, it was yours to fill. Why do we have this authorization step? What is that for? Formal approval from the board. Form okay. So the minutes is approved, it's documented. So so putting it in the budget is not the, the, we, we got an opinion that it needs to be approved through a board review. Oh. Regardless so of it's just it's, one of those it's just a format. The way it it's is. like you budget it, get the budget approved, but then the actual position is approved through a work okay. proceeding, it's in the minutes. That's and, my understanding. And I'm still going to go back to my question here. If we authorize this position today, and let's say next June we lift the hiring freeze, is it still your intent to come back to us and ask for permission before filling it, even if the hiring freeze is no longer in effect? My intent, as written here, Linda, and I want to be clear on this, this position should the board authorize me to have the position will not be filled until the board says, Sheriff, we are comfortable with the county's financial position. We feel it's appropriate now to fund that position. You may go ahead and hire. And without that, my intent is clear. I want the position right now. And when the board is ready uh, to give me that position, then we will fill it once the board gives the approval. So when you say when the board does that, that means a motion at the board table. Yes, I mean anything. We okay, do, well, do I just want to make it clear <laughs> since you know we're talking about yeah. We're talking about. <laughs> so I still am at the fairness thing about we have two other positions that are out there. 
I think we did the operations. Yeah. No, no, I'm sorry, in different departments, in different offices. The One is ours. Office. Oh, yes, okay, you're right. But then we had community yeah. services, you know, one, the homeless, or uh, homeless prevention, and then in the attorney's office, right, the victim's liaison or whatever. We were one of the three authorized positions originally, or one of the three that were approved. Right, no, I understand that, yep. Nick, but I'm just trying to figure out, you come forward with the request, do we really, do we do it for the other two also? But I don't know that we approve those other ones. We yeah, we put them in the budget. budget. And community those services are, is still in the budget. From those the department's offices have not come and asked that we should be operating. They will need to come to the board meeting and ask you to operate those positions before they go. Right, I understand that. Okay, I just know. like you're doing now. They could send exactly the same letter saying the exactly the same thing. It's saying so that we would be, uh, that, that's what I'm looking at, what's fair. No, I know the sheriff's the one come forward. So I'm just back to this whole rationale here. But, but the final decision, the way it has been crafted, is left totally in the hands of the Board of Supervisors at a formal, open, public meeting. Just so you understand that what you're what you're offering there, what you're suggesting, is a different process than we have done with the other positions. It would be an additional process. Also, let, let me ask you, Ms. Sheriff, if we he's understanding your comment there. I, I know, but I saw some other people nodding. It looks like you're it looks like you're asking for something like that, even if the higher degrees is lifted. But the board wants to take action because that's no longer in place. It would require that what you're talking and, and giving us guidance on is, is that you would come back and say, hey, I intend to fill this yeah. before you would actually fill it. Now, one thing I do want the board to consider. I would like to fill it, not intend to. I'd like, I would like to. <laughs> I, I do want to remind the board, I know there's two other positions that haven't been authorized. A recruitment for a deputy sheriff needs to take a lot longer than any other position has done. So they do have to look out six months in advance. So what? So that's yeah. I'd like to follow up on that from a standpoint about. But can you even if we haven't authorized them, if if we haven't said go, can you still? Are you still able to offer to start your process? Because you're not able to offer anybody a job. With no position available, I'm not going to offer a position, uh, anybody a job. Right, okay. Are you going to start the process, the six-month process for the list of districts? Understand the Code of Iowa states that you must have a civil service list, and that civil service list is good for two years. Once that civil service list is expired, either through hiring everybody on the list or uh, giving reasons why you're, why you're not hiring remaining people on the list, then a new list must be created. So there's always a list out there and that takes care of the front end, but you still have the other aspects to go ahead before you actually do the hiring. You have the background, you have the psychological test, the interview with the clinical psychologist. Um, you have uh, uh, a couple other steps. But none but, of that would happen until you got a candidate to go through that. You don't do it for everybody, right? None of that would be done until the Board of Supervisors says you have permission to hire to fill that position. Then we go to the list and then we finish what we need to do on that list to bring that person on. So I worked my numbers, you know, I started my, my little informal chart again here, okay, or, or spreadsheet. And, you know, every month that goes by that this position is not filled this is the sheriff's got that money in his budget still right i mean because we we put it in the budget i was headed there Alyssa. okay all right i was headed there all right so i and i took in the also the attorney one and the community service one okay and act all together at a year there we your estimate two hundred ninety five thousand cost Okay, to us as, as a county, but then that's one twelfth of it every month. But then you turn right back around, and we only budget at ninety five percent. I've allocated just in my little informal list four hundred fifty thousand. 
just for us out of, out of general fund, that yes, some money comes out of secondary revenues, et cetera. But okay, so I look at we're about even without any COVID expenses. That's where I came up, okay, is taking the 447,000 that it appeared <coughs> at least in Markley's calculations, then taking a look at what we would get from just the first month, August, of these positions not being filled. And then I took out what the, the other 5% would be, and I estimated at 450,000. And so I came up with, we're just breaking even here. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know that from that standpoint that financially where we are right now um, is that I, I would still be very uncomfortable in saying yay. And I understand you're asking down the road. So I'm back to the pros and the cons of letting, of right now granting this and then anticipating that we would be getting those requests coming forward from the attorney's office to go ahead and get, have the same deal. And then we would, I understand where all of you, but I'm thinking ahead mm -hmm. here and then, and then looking at the community services. Uh, if, just to throw out there, say if the other two would come forward and said, we would have our positions approved too, the board could still approve them but still not authorize them to be hired because there's a hiring freeze. Right. Same thing that would go here. Right. I'm just wanting the position on the books. That's all I'm asking for. There, there's no devious act here. There's no trying to <laughs> trick the board. Right. It's just, this is a formality that when we went through, you know how we prepare our budget for the budget work session, how the sheriff's office does that. We do that. And this is another step that we have to include to include in it in the upcoming or future years if I don't get it this year. And that that discussion and the budgeting was made for the current fiscal year we're in now. And if we go by without authorizing that position, then next year I gotta start the process all over again. I'm just asking you to see if that's an unnecessary step. All the board's doing is filling a formality here by allowing the sheriff's office to have the position, and it will not be filled until the board would authorize it in an open meeting. Whether or not that is before or after we lift the hiring freeze. Regardless. Yeah, okay. It just seems to me clunky because it seems to be adding like one more step into a process that's already got several steps. And maybe that's maybe that's why I'm literally it's taking away a, a, pro, a step. Sure. Here comes Nick. Maybe he'll mind if I comment. Please. Yeah, and some of this recaps what the sheriff had brought up. But essentially, what this comes down to is efficiency. There's already been a lot of work put into um, coming to the board initially, uh, giving you the justification for why that position was needed. I don't think there was any um, disagreement among the board or really anybody in the room that there was need for that position. So I think we can all agree on that. I think we're looking at two issues here today. We're looking at process and maybe financially. And so to be very clear, there is no financial uh, commitment that we're asking of the board with the authorization of this position. It's a formality. Um, it's just authoring, authorizing us to um, have that position. Um, it will not be filled until the sheriff comes back in front of the board, irregardless of the hiring freeze that you have in place. Um, in regards to the uh, comment that it may be adding a step, in my view, it's actually saving a lot more time and it's much more efficient to address this now and, and to move this along now because we've already addressed it and realized the need is there. There is no financial commitment uh, that we're asking of you today or at any time in the future until the board decides you're ready to take on that financial commitment. So that just leaves us down to the process. And so as we address the process, um, as we're proposing it, it may change slightly from what you're looking at with other positions, but in the big picture, I think the process is much more efficient to address it, consider it, and hopefully approve it today, as opposed to all that work that's gone into it in the past, go to waste, we have to come back in front and utilize all that time and decision-making of not only the board, but staff members to consider it again and to get it to a point where it's justified. So we're really simply, you know, out of efficiency and where we've been so far, um, asking for that position to be authorized. There is no financial commitment. Be very clear, the hiring freeze that you have, even if you lifted that hiring freeze next month, 
that position would not be filled until we came back in front of you guys and you all considered it again and approved it financially. So, and this is an, another factor here as I sort this through and I, I'd like to come back and look at, at how the sheriff has had an arrangement with the board that the board gives him a budgeted amount, a dollar amount every year. And then whatever he doesn't spend, regardless of what he doesn't spend it on, he then can come back and make requests. Usually he comes back, he comes back in the last quarter or sometimes as you say, you've given money back to the county, okay? So this position is $134,000 if you count the car and the whole bit. I mean, the position doesn't pay that, but when you're taking the benefits and then there's another squad car, whatever we call it, patrol car, all right, stuff. So this is $134,000. So um, as, as I see this, as soon as we know about COVID, if I were staying on the board, okay, I would want to fill it um, soon, as soon as we knew more about COVID, because I'd want that money to go to a deputy rather than it maybe go to some other thing at the last quarter of the year. All right, that's how you would always have it come to your budget, right? Okay. So I am factoring that in combined with what both the sheriff and Nick had said about process. I'm also factoring in what I heard Connie say is the next civil service commission round is September, correct? Um, we just did that in testing. And we're in the oh. process of getting ready to interview. So by the time we get the list ready, the civil service will, will certify our list probably in September. And then that list is gonna be valid for two years. If nobody leaves, if you guys don't approve this position, we wouldn't hire anybody from that list. But in two years, we've got to make a new okay. list. So it, it doesn't matter. We have to have that list, no matter if we have an opening or not. Got it. And the point is list. that if, if, if the position were hired near the end of the year, it's not going to be 138. I understand that. Which year, your salary is not annualized. So that is correct. And so every month, Basically, there's this build up of in the discretionary fund for the wants fund of the sheriff, given that how they've always worked it out. That's not how it's been with like the attorney's office per se, as it, it's clearly stated. And that position, I think I had there about 66,000. And the, the other position that I'm trying to equate it with fairly has to do with community services and that's under our control anyway. Okay, so anyway, so I just want, I just did want to point that out here that there are, there are, there's a financial ramification and I, you know, um, like I said, if I were staying, I guess I'd rather have a deputy on the road. You know, I, but, I, I think whatever, whatever we do, I mean, there, there was going to be, there would be a financial, whether you look at it now or you look at it down the road. Right. I do think the public has an expectation of, um, uh, you know, police service. Mm -hmm. um, and it was yeah. seen yesterday and going on today. Right. Um, as uh, um, uh, Nick, as you just said, is um, collectively we did talk about and seem supportive of it at our board meeting back in January when you came before us. I don't think that's the question, the question at all um, because there is that expectation of, of protection out there. Um, from what I'm hearing from both of you um, is that you want the position authorized so that in the future when finances are good you can fill that position understanding in the long term it comes to continue providing that level or a higher level of protection for the citizens throughout Story County. That's that's yeah. what I'm hearing. So so I, I'm being convinced here. Okay, even though it's a change from a, a pretty strong stand I took a couple months ago. All right. Um, and part of that, I will tell you, has to do with going on as COVID continues. We just, all right, the other part of it is, is yeah, yeah, you guys were invaluable yesterday. This is what you do. And that has, has softened me up. Okay. So, and so, um, yeah, I'll make, well, let's see, it's not my turn. It's your turn. Oh, maybe it is. It's you. It is my turn. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to make the motion. All right. That we um, we agree to this um, 
So uh, as stated in the sheriff's uh, proposal letter, um, with, the under, with the clear understanding that it's a vote by the board that will be required then to authorize to fill it. Because you're authorizing. We're authorizing, We're authorizing today. Authorizing. Then we uh, give the authorization to fill it. Okay. All right. There's my motion. Period. How we do we authorize one additional deputy sheriff position with the understanding that the sheriff will come back to the board with permission to fill it? I like that. Did you get that? Yeah. Okay. All right. There's my second. Okay. Who's been seconded? Any further discussion? If not, Olson. Um, I, Evan, I. <laughs> I know. We'll just call it ourselves <laughs> today. <laughs> I. Motion, motion carried. And I, I would just okay. would entertain that, you know, I guess the other two, or at least the attorney needs to look at what the attorney wants. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Next, we have public hearing item consideration of part of Iowa Nature Trail Slater Connector final plans. And uh, conservation director Mike Cox is here to explain this and will explain the, why the board of or the conservation board has not yet approved this and why you'd like us to continue on today. Uh, good morning again, and thank you. Um, yeah, so this is uh, under public hearing today as required, of course, as you know, for any of our bid letting uh, yeah, projects. Please speak up a little bit louder. I'm sorry. <laughs> that works. Can you hear me? <laughs> I'll, I'll try to speak a little louder. So this is, uh, this is a re requirement, as you know, with any public improvement project for um, over a, that, that requires a bid. Uh, that uh, we go through a public hearing process. So we're here at the public hearing to approve the uh, contract, form of contract, specifications, et cetera, for paving a portion of the Heart of Iowa Nature Trail between R38 and uh, I should say west of R38 um, in Slater uh, that will take it to the, the western terminus of the Heart of Iowa Trail where it connects to the High Trestle Trail. Um, that section has not been paved yet. Um, obviously, we have paved um, a section from the uh, Shua, from the east of R38 over toward um, Huxley. Uh, that has been paved, uh, but we have one small connector there in the city that's owned by the county that we haven't done yet. And that's what this project is for, is to pave, to get bids back on paving that small section. Um, we have, as you know, and, and I'll, let me explain a little bit why I'm requesting that you approve this today, contingent on the Conservation Board. The Conservation Board would have considered this last night, um, and thank you, Linda, for that explanation. But since the Conservation Board didn't meet um, last night, then I'm asking for your consideration and, and um, maybe perhaps recommending that you do it contingent on um, conservation board um, approval. Uh, I will get a conservation, a special meeting of the conservation board set up this week uh, in order to do that. Um, the reason why I don't like to slip this one uh, is that this requires a pretty extensive public notice uh, and this and, and to have the public hearing, which we did for this meeting. Um, and so I, I, I guess I'm requesting your, uh, your approval with that contingency on the Conservation Board so that when they meet um, and if they approve it, um, then we can release uh, invitation for bids. At the moment, the bid, the anticipated um, bid opening was going to be August 25th that is going to have to slip um, with this now until the next, op next option would be September 1st, um, which backs everything up, you know, uh, accordingly one week. So um, with that, I guess I'll take any questions you may have on it. 
My only question, Mike, is just um, related to now the you know the related the fact to that relate, related to that. Um, uh, are we sure our estimate is is in the ballpark? I mean, we we've seen you know in the one we're going to consider on Friday, those bids we got once again ten percent off. Okay, so when did Shy Patter, Pattery actually do these numbers? Um, they gave us a they gave us a cost opinion. Uh, I'm going to say three weeks ago. Okay, so they're pretty. All right, that was my only question. Yeah. Supervisor Hedlund, do you have any questions? I don't have any additional questions at this time. Okay. Not then. I would entertain a no. motion. That's public, public hearing. hearing. Public hearing. Thank you. I will open the public hearing. Are there any comments? Public. Please unmute yourself. Your comment. Okay. Seeing or hearing no comments, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. Uh, I move approval of the Iowa Nature Trail Player Connection final plan uh, contingent on the Conservation Board uh, meeting and vote. I second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we approve contingent on the Conservation Department or Conservation Board's approval. Uh, any further discussion? Not Hedden. I Olson. I Merkin. I approve. Thank you. And then we are going to. Is everybody still okay with deferring item 14-1 to Friday? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. And next we have Melissa Woodnell on uh, discussion and consideration of revised temporary employment practices and policies in response to COVID-19. Good morning, Melissa. Good morning. Well, this would be number the fifth revision um, to this temporary policy, employment practices and policies. We knew going into this that things were going to change and we have to make updates. I did go through um, on a few of them and, and just made some suggestions on how we handled a few of the infection control practices um, as far as, um, you know, for travel or other meetings. Um, I know in there it said eliminate non-essential gatherings of 10 or more. I know our facility staff has went through and done um, occupancy based on social distancing and some of our locations do allow more than 10 people. So I did put that in there. Um, I um, added just some clarification under the identification and isolation of employees that have symptoms or come into contact with symptoms. Just clearly guidance from the Department of Public Health or Story County Public Health. And then I did add a section um, on supporting employees. I know we're, we're getting back into the time where uh, schools are getting, going to start back. Um, so, um, I did add some, some language in there. Um, right now, um, there is federal law that if a school is closed, there's emergency FMLA that can be used. I have checked and, and, and checked with uh, various attorneys and, and sources. The Department of Labor has not come out with any other guidance, new guidance on this. Um, I anticipate them coming out with it. I don't know when, <laughs> unfortunately. So, so in there, it just pretty much what, what I'm recommending is just employees work with their um, department or office to see if there's any flexibilities available. If they have concerns with daycare or um, I know some of the schools are doing a hybrid where they have partial online and in-person um, schooling. If the school would choose to go 100% online, then the emergency FMLA would cover that because it would be 100% or at least that's the opinion that, that in the school there is no, nobody can go on site. It would be clo technically closed according to the law. So. So um, I'm just, there's a couple of types. Sure, of yeah, I know, later. intermittent, okay. intermittent know. should be intermittent. So, yeah. yeah, okay, so, so on to the real change itself sure. about childcare. Sure. 
So as I thought about this, I, I wonder if it is appropriate for it to be the department heads. I know the elected officials always have that, you know, relationship and that they have to say about what their employees can and can't uh, do. Okay. But in, here's my thought is that we've got the different school districts just here, what, five different school districts in Story County alone, and none of them are going to seem to be doing it exactly the same way. And then that's before it, other things happen, all right, and whatever may happen with the gut, with the state uh, regulations or instructions. In addition, we have people who commute from other counties. So we've got a lot of different policies that the department heads could end up having to deal with in trying to accommodate. And I'm concerned that we're going to end up in a situation where an employee or multiple employees say that's not fair. So and so gets to have this accommodation, or so and so gets to do this, but I don't. And um, I'm wondering if if we took that off of the department heads and put it on the board of supervisors instead, so at least it's a final decision. Um, that the employees, at least if they're going to think somebody was unfair, it's not either one of our directors, either you or, or uh, Senator King, or the department head. That's my, just my thinking. I'm thinking about because we've already had comments made about morale related to having employees under different sets of rules, okay? And so that's just my concern here, is that at least if, this, if it had to come to the supervisors, although I know that the down, real big downside is that we're voting on something in public, okay, which we're kind of having people's yeah. personal lives put out there. I'm okay. a little confused. What exactly in the policy is it that you're suggesting be changed? That rather than you work it out with your department head as the final approval, that or, or in the event, you know, or a director as a final approval, that it, the final approval about if you get these kind of flexibilities or accommodations come to the Board of Supervisors. That's what I'm saying, okay? My only comment is that um, department heads, when they're hired, they are given some discretion in, in making employment decisions within their own department, um, unless it requires formal board action, which would be to hire or change their salary. So. I would consider this as the same as that. You know, they handle their own employee discipline, counseling, evaluation process, different things like that. Um, I would suggest leaving it up with the department heads. I, for, from an HR standpoint, I don't think it, it needs board approval, but I, I understand how you want to take that off of the department heads, but they are hired to make those decisions for their office. I, I, I think too, in my, in my opinion, and, and I'm more for leaving it with the department head. Um, I look at things could be changing quickly with various school districts mm -hmm. and then having to wait to bring before a board of supervisors. Um, I think we need to give that more of that authority or that discretion to that department head in this ever changing mm -hmm. situation. Um, you said you've already changed this policy. This will be number five. Yeah, yeah. I would be surprised <laughs> if the Department of Labor then comes out with some guidance <laughs> and Alyssa's before us again for a seventh time. Uh, unfortunately, having to change to change. That. I think that's a good. Point and and the departments do call HR, so we can try to be consistent across the organization. Again, there's not one set way. I mean, different offices and departments have different positions, and there are flexibilities with some, and there aren't with others. So it's really tough to put forward a policy that is very black and white, clear cut. It, it, it's not possible with this. Sure. Of course, so. are you suggesting these four bullets? Telework on certain days, allow flexible schedule from possible use of paid leave to accommodate part and unpaid leave of absence. That's the plan that will be put together for the employee. Are you suggesting that the board of supervisors make those decisions? Well, no, I, am I suggesting it? Yes, but I brought it up more as a concern, okay, for a discussion than I did any kind of adamant, you know, I think it should be in this way, okay? Based upon it is a changing situation, and I just am concerned based upon the recent feedback we got about you know the some departments uh, feeling feeling like they're not being treated the same way. You know the comment that was made about some people not even understanding what our COVID policies are. 
you know, uh, because of how it's been handled. And it's a difficult and delicate situation because you're dealing with individuals and you're dealing with their personal lives. So you don't want to put them out there. So I brought it up more for discussion, brainstorming about it. You know, um, Alyssa's answers are good. Lisa's reasoning is good too. I don't think there's a good clear cut answer here other than maybe for the employees to know we did we are acknowledging that not everything ends up looking fair. Well, and I, think, fair. I think you can't say that everything is going to be consistent because the situations are not consistent. Right. First exactly. of all, you have different job descriptions in different departments. Yeah. Secondly, you have this different school districts, as you pointed out. Third, you may have a different number of children, ages of children, all of those things. And it really, if you bring all of that to the board, I don't know that we'd be making what would be looked at as consistent decisions either. I agree. I was thinking that okay. I'm going to come back to the morale and taking some pressure off the department heads, which is, I was just saying, hey, you might as well not like us, as opposed to your department heads. Yeah, I do understand. They're hired to make those decisions. You and, and uh, Sandra are hired, and that's your responsibility to go ahead and, and, and see that help those decisions made. I just, Maybe, you know, I think so many people are suffering a little bit of fatigue right now, just COVID fatigue. And I was looking for an alleviation, some way to alleviate it off of the department heads who are bearing incredible burdens right now. And so, yeah, I'm sure they appreciate your concern for that. So, uh, are there any other questions or comments about the proposed policy changes? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the revised temporary employment practices and policies. My, yeah, okay. I so move that we <coughs> approve them as presented with, with correction for typos. Yeah, we are letting us. Yeah. Oh, I'll go back through it again. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none. Olson? Aye. Pedden? Aye. Second. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you for keeping us up to date on this. And and these, these are good changes. Obviously, we've learned some things that have gone along with the situation and incorporated, incorporated as well. Also, looking looking ahead to say what's going to happen with the school situation, I think that's a good work. So, thank you. Next, under um, additional items three, uh, the draft letter to the DOT, we are deferring that for Friday's agenda. And then we will go on to item four, discussion and consideration of special event application for crushed rock classic bike time trial. Jerry Moore and uh, Scott Wall here as well. So who's going to start? Jerry? Good morning, board. Uh, Jerry Moore, Planning and Development. Um, as you stated, Linda, this is a special event for Crush Rock Classic Bike Time Trial. And it's the fifth annual event. Um, this one's different from the previous years uh, because it's not a, exactly a race, but racing against time, um, hence the time trial. It's to be located at the Sunny Heights Bed and Breakfast at 17641 on Templeton Road, uh, which is just north of the city of Ames uh, and east of the city of Gilbert. The um, uh, the special events um, provisions and regulations are found in Chapter 83. Um, it's, it identifies planning and development as being the department to reach out to the various um, departments uh, with a focus really of the safety of the volunteers, the participants, and the spectators, and really anyone else who might come in contact with the, with the event from the general public. And so we're tasked with reaching out to the sheriff, to the fire chief or chiefs, uh, ambulance support services, environmental health, the county engineer's office, Story County Conservation, emergency management department, and then other cities. Uh, we usually try to reach out to cities within two miles of the event. And so this event is on a over 22 mile course, multi-surface, on paved and gravel roads. Uh, we provided that information in the email. Uh, it also goes through the east edge of McFarland Park. Um, Scott Wall is the race director, and I understand that he's also on the call this morning uh, and can answer any questions that you might have. 
Uh, the activity is scheduled for 10 o'clock on the event day, uh, which is August 22nd, um, to end at about 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, vendors are to bring, uh, there are no vendors, and so the participants are to bring their own food and beverage. Um, potable water, water source is on site, um, and as of last week it was tested are being tested by the Environmental Health Department. We have a condition uh, addressing that, and I'll go through that at the end. Uh, they will have a generator on site for electrical power source, portable toilets, uh, washing hand stations, hand sanitizer, first aid kit, and then also garbage containers um, where the, um, you know, the, the, the congregating of you know, the event staff and the participants will be, uh, and also where the start and finish is. The um, information was routed on the 3rd of August, uh, and we had a meeting, a Zoom meeting on the 5th, um, and there were some good discussions. I won't go into all of the details, uh, but uh, Keith Morgan, the emergency management, did provide some really good input and suggested that this race event information be provided to the EMS chiefs, and he volunteered to provide that um, to those. Also suggested that the National Weather uh, Service have this information so that they could uh, be um, on the lookout for you know, adverse weather conditions on that day, which is always helpful. Um, uh, Ray Reynolds, fire chief, of the city of Nevada provided some input and requested a person point of contact in, in case there was a medical emergency, somebody that you know they could uh, go to for accurate information involving the incident, and that information uh, was provided. Um, and as I said, there's additional information that's provided. And it's in the email. Um, after the meeting, we did hear from uh, this. The Sheriff's Department, Captain Lenny, uh, didn't, basically said that he didn't have any uh, major concerns and that he would update the staff at the Sheriff's Office with regard to the event. Um, Keith Morgan suggested that uh, a reach out be made to the Gilbert Fire Chief, and um, they, apparently they have a gator, which is good for like off-road situations, and since the, the racers will be going through the east end of McFarland Park, he suggested that they communicate with the chief, and the chief uh, did respond and indicate that he would make sure that that uh, vehicle or equipment would, was available for that day. And basically, uh, that this, it takes us to the condition. Uh, planning and development staff is recommending approval, you know, based on the submittal, based on responses to the questions, uh, based on the input of all of the um, reviewers of this special event. And there's three conditions. The first one has to do with providing the insurance certificate, which um, uh, Scott indicated that uh, he will apply for. He has to wait until he gets permission from the board before he can do that. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, Environmental Health tested the water source, and um, I don't know what the results of that is, but if it's not safe for human consumption or if it cannot be used, like for cleaning and whatnot, um, then the applicant uh, will need to provide that water source. And then the last thing is we'll do a site inspection prior to the event, primarily focusing on the event headquarters to make sure all these items are in place prior to the event. I also want to add that the Story County Board of Health um, met on the 4th and reviewed this request and also recommended uh, that it be approved. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I don't have any questions for you, Jerry, at this time. I see that um, Darren's not on. I just wasn't sure if you would run across any particular signage, as Darren pointed out, that is down because of the storm. That's the only thing that kind of popped into my mind at this particular time. Um, that, um, and 
that I just I don't know and I don't see Darren on there and I don't know Jerry if you would know that particular <coughs> answer if that's what the race would encounter and could be problematic at all. It is still a little under two weeks away, so if they're focusing on stop signs first. Hopefully we can get them all in, in two weeks. And hopefully we can get all our signage in, in two weeks just as a, as a calendar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on how many posts they can procure. Right, right, right. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's would be a Darren question. Yeah, that was just, just from the storm yesterday and Darren's comment of today. That was just my my one concern that came up from the discussion today. Um, I don't have any questions. I want to thank you and your committee, Scott, for recognizing with COVID that people are bringing their own food. So you're not going to, yep. right? You're yeah, not going to worry about feeding people. And second of all, you're saying, hey, masks, unless you're competing. I mean, you would basically have said you would have to have masks. Yes. Oh, yeah. And we do have, I did purchase masks already in advance. If people don't bring a mask, we can provide them with a temporary mask. Yeah. So thank you for that. And I also believe a recommendation from the Board of Health too, which also at the end of the race is to ensure that people weren't congregating. Yeah. yeah. Right. And we, we discussed that with the Board of Health. We discussed it with, with Jerry and, and the other department heads the following day. That this, this, the nature of this kind of race, with the mass start race, which this was in the past, people want to hang around and watch everybody else finish. When the time tells people come in by themselves, you know, they start at 30 second intervals, so they'll finish at large intervals. Um, people usually have a sense of if they did well or not. If they didn't do well and they know they didn't, they'll just go home because we're not offering food or drink, nothing to keep people there. Uh, people that travel with other people might stay for, well, I hope they stay <laughs> for all their people to finish. <laughs> but, but if we get, the maximum field size is 150. I don't really expect that many, but even if we got 150, by the time everybody's done, there'll probably be 50 people or less that have stayed around throughout the whole time. And we'll do the awards for each. There's four different categories. We do awards for each category as soon as they finish and we get the results. So I'll start as a, well, not as a group, but we'll start the first category at, you know, the first rider going in 30 seconds, gone down the line until the last rider in that division is gone. And then the rider for the next division will start. So we'll have results for each division before the whole thing is finished. And we get them their prizes, and get them on the road, you know, strongly encourage people to. Yeah, we'd love for you to hang around, but we don't want you to hang around. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next year. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. Thank you. And there is, there is a lot of space at the Sunny Heights location where people do want to stay. Some people, they can spread out. Okay. And we'll have a portable PA where we can encourage people to frequently to go, stay apart. If you travel with somebody, you can stay together, but mm -hmm. otherwise, let's keep a distance between those, those small groups that travel together. Okay, any other questions or comments? If not, the uh, planning and development is recommending that we approve the special events permit with conditions as put forth in case ADMA or 4-20. ADMS. N. Thank you. Okay, so I'd entertain a motion. So move. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? If not, heads. Aye. Olson. Aye. Merkin. Aye. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Scott. Thank, Thank you. you. And Thank this you. is a side note. I would expect to get the insurance certificates within three to five days. I hope by the end of the week I'll have those, and I'll just forward them on to to Jerry. Sure. Thank you. Okay. And now we go on to item five: discussion and consideration of draft letter to City of Ames and City of Gilbert addressing Ames Urban Fringe Plan areas, primary for Story County. Jerry. Yes, Jerry. Planning and development. Um, this is the draft letter uh, that we've been uh, working on. Planning development staff, the Planning and Zoning Commission, and the Board of Supervisors on the three meetings that we've had in uh, May and July. Uh, the letter, draft letter was before the Planning and Zoning Commission and they recommended that the Board of Supervisors approve it in its current form. Um, we did listen to all of the meetings and I think we've um, accurately uh, reflected the primary or the predominant uh, issues that were raised. The goal was to, 
to somewhat build on the letter that was previously sent to the City of Ames and the City of Gilbert uh, that was dated uh, March 26th of 2019. Um, and again, I, I won't go through all the details, but we've added a little more clarity, a little more information on uh, doing a better job of transportation planning, which would also involve M the MPO, a um, little more uh, substance on housing planning, uh, including affordable housing, uh, including information that uh, we obtained from our countywide housing assessment needs that we're going to be working on, um, trying to match up better with growth projections uh, based on the City of Ames' 2040 comp plan and these urban residential areas, which are, you know, according to the policies, these are areas that are supposed to be prime for future annexation. Um, you know, mentioning some of the environmental issues, uh, concerns with flooding and trying to keep development out of these uh, flood zones or in, in watersheds, uh, creating goals and policies for public lands, which include parks and recreation areas, um, and then including a need to look at the land use uh, due to the DOT's um, plan really to, show, to close the at-grade crossings along Highway 30 from the interchange to Nevada. And then lastly, to reach out to the city of Kelly and, and Boone County to gauge their interest in joining us in this um, Ames and Trench Plan Amendment. And um, I guess the goal in this is, uh, you know, if this is supported by the board, we will um, make sure that this is received by the city council and the mayor at the city of Ames and the city of Gilbert. And um, staff will start working with this with the city staff and and just work on the details of the amendment process. Be happy to answer any questions. Other questions? I think it's a very good job. I think yeah, well worded and really addressed the issues that, that we identified. Thank you. Then is there a motion to do the letter? Oh, sorry. Somebody gets <laughs> Okay, I would entertain a motion for approval. My turn. <coughs> I would so move that uh, we uh, approve the chair, Linda Burkin, to sign this letter and for it to be sent. Second. I move to second to, to send this letter. Uh, Owen, um, Olson, I'm sorry. Aye. Ed, aye. American aye. Letter is approved. Thank you, Jerry. Um, Thank you, board. Next, we'll go on to discussion and consideration of the Ames Urban Fringe Plan Amendment application. Submit a request from Larson Leasing. Or be located at 23050 580th Avenue. This Amelia or Jerry? Jerry. Actually, Jerry. this is Jerry. You're going to get, <laughs> you'll finally get to hear from Amelia after this item. Um, but okay. as you mentioned, Linda, <laughs> this is a Ames Urban Fringe Plan um, application submittal request, which is the first stage in the process. Uh, two of the three entities uh, are required to, um, you know, you need support from two of the three to allow an applicant to submit an application for full review. Uh, so again, this is from Larson Leeson, Leasing, who is Scott Larson, and he acquired the property at 23959 580th Avenue. It's a 22-acre parcel, currently zoned A2 Agribusiness, and he would like to, to change the use and the scope to um, to a situation where under our zoning it would permit um, it would be it would be actually be zoned commercial light industrial if it were to stay in the unincorporated area of the county. Um, his goal is to to do some interior remodeling to the building and create spaces for offices and create spaces for warehouse for 
for multiple businesses. And so this request, again, just the question of whether or not the application can be submitted was before the Ames City Council on July 28th. Ames City Council supported uh, Larson Leeson's request to submit the application. Um, and they also indicated that they have interest in having the applicant submit a voluntary annexation. And so if that happens, it's likely that it would include this parcel and then the two parcels that are north of it, which are under the same ownership, and then it would be contiguous to the city's current cultural limits. Um, so again, it's the first stage in the process um, and requires two of the three. Ames City Council has approved it, as I stated on July 28th. Um, if the board supports allowing Larson Leasing to submit the application, uh, once they submit that, it will be um, reviewed thoroughly and analyzed, and um, it will go before the Planning and Zoning Commission of the county and then ultimately on to the Board of Supervisors for review and consideration. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Sir, are there any questions for Jerry? No, I don't have any. Okay. And would entertain, I'd entertain a motion for approval of Ames Urban Trench Plan Amendment application for Larson Leasing. So moved. Second. Okay. Further discussion, if not, Heavens? Aye. Olson? Aye. Merkin? Aye. It's approved. Thank you. Now we will hear Thank from Amelia both. on a special event application with Flicks on the Farm. I've been waiting for this one. Uh -huh. Good morning, board. Morning. Yep, Flicks on a Farm is a two-night drive-in movie event that's proposed um, for August 28th and 29th. It will be on Krista Dunn's property at 27682 560th. Um, and the other applicant is her neighbor, Sherry Hosting. I believe they are on the line this morning if you have any questions for them. Um, but essentially, the idea is just a drive-in movie. Um, there will be some food vendors there. We anticipate three food trucks um, and anticipate approximately 125 vehicles each night. Um, we will need a copy of the Department of Inspections and Appeals um, permits for the food trucks. The Nevada Fire Chief has also requested that um, he do an inspection of the food trucks before the event. Um, for fire code issues, um, and those are both recommended as conditions of approval. Um, the applicant will also be monitoring the weather and has been in touch with um, Channel 5 meteorologists um, to assist in monitoring, and Keith Morgan has also put them in touch with the um, National Weather Service to assist in monitoring as well. Um, they will have event insurance through FunFlix Outdoor Movies. Um, they will provide a copy of that policy um, if you all take the action to approve the event. Um, and they are recommending but not requiring face coverings for vendors and attendees if they cannot maintain a six foot separation distance, for instance, in line for the food vendors or restrooms. Um, we did have county departments and others review this application on August 5th. Um, in addition to environmental health and emergency management, and um, county engineering and secondary roads. We also had um, the Nevada Fire Chief Ray Reynolds and Chris Perrin with Mary Greeley Medical Center. Um, they did have a few additional comments I wanted to touch on. Um, Ray Reynolds suggested crowd management training um, for the applicant and provided a link to that. And Chris Perrin with Mary Greeley Medical Center um, has reached out to see if there's an AED available. Um, and also wanted to make sure that there was an emergency lighting and a way for emergency vehicles to access the site if needed during the movie. Um, planning and development will also schedule a site inspection on the Friday before an event, before the event um, to make sure that they are um, putting on the event in accordance with their plans and our requirements for special events and recommendations um, from the review. Um, and so with that, we are recommending approval of the special event with conditions, and those are that a copy of the Department of Inspections and Appeals Food Establishment Permit is submitted, a copy of the insurance certificate is submitted, 
um, an inspection by the Nevada Fire Chief of the food trucks um, shall occur, and planning and development shall also complete an inspection prior to the event. Um, I am happy to take any questions. And again, I believe the applicant is on the line as well. Are there any questions for Amelia or for the applicant? Yeah, I have a couple of questions, and I'm not sure if it'll go to Amelia or to the applicant. Um, this is Supervisor Fenton, in case you're just on the phone. So um, I'm looking at 125 vehicles, maybe two people in there, so you know, 250 people or more in attendance. Um, I'm just wondering how to maintain social distancing if people are getting out to go to the food trucks. How to minimize kind of congregation um, would be going on, or um, if someone could speak could speak to that. This is Amelia, and I, I guess again um, we did ask if face coverings would be required, and the applicant indicated that they would be recommended. Um, and I'm, well, I'm not sure if the applicant can also speak. Stop to it. That. Is the applicant on the line? Would like to hear from the applicant on this, please. The so applicant's not okay. hello. Sorry, I was muted. This is Krista Dunn. Hello. Yeah. Can you, get, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you hear the question? Yes, we did. Um, so the cars will be spaced far enough apart. We did the um, requirements of the county. So while someone is watching the movie, they will be socially distanced, spaced apart. Um, if they get up and move around, like I said, we will be handing out sheets um, to everybody recommending face masks be worn when you can't socially distance. Um, as far as the food trucks, we will have the space marked out while they're in line. You know, just like you see at Target, you have to wait, you know, until you're called up. So we'll mark those spots um, six feet apart as well. So this is Supervisor Olson, and I'm going to follow up on this, Kristen, because um, we all can just see what's happening out in public, and you are providing a great fundraiser. This looks so much fun. It's just great, the thoughts and energy you put into this. But I am very concerned that it's going to be difficult for people to, it's just difficult for people to know uh, six feet and you've got kids who want to run up to each other or whatever. So here's my question. Would you, uh, would you be willing to go ahead and say that face masks are required when you're outside of the car and for all vendors? Just take care of that, not worry about the social distancing issue. Well, yeah, I hear too, but. Yeah. So if we require it, I mean, how do we, how do you suggest we police that or, you know, manage that? Dave, would you please, could you please wear a, put on your mask? That's it. I mean, we don't expect you to turn into yeah. the. To, to, to into that, but but to say if, if, if your sheet that you hand out and your publicity says very specifically um, we're we're uh, requiring face masks because you're on private property, you know. So right. So you say sorry if you're not going to comply, and you guys seem like not being able to do the six and the six feet. You know, he's asking to leave. Uh, but so I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm thinking that this is going to be a great time for everybody and great times with people who go to school, you know, the kids that go to school together and parents from the PTA, et cetera, that it's going to be just easier for you to say right up front, face masks required, and then have to ask the occasional person to remind them, right? Oh, don't forget your face mask if you're getting out of your car. And I think you'll be fine. I'm happy to say that we are requiring requiring them, but if somebody is not willing to do it, I'm not going to kick them off the property. That's your choice. It's private property. So, okay. All right, we'll put required in our sheet. Thank you. Supervisor Hedges, did you have another question? No, I mean, my main thing, well, uh, I guess my other question, I think that was kind of answered, is to how do you minimize folks congregating? 
uh, at the food trucks. And I don't know how many food trucks you're having. Again, I'm looking at 125 cars and just, I'm just doubling thing two per car. You know, you may have more than that, but I'm just looking at that. So you're looking at potentially 250 people of wanting to make sure they're social distanced. Um, was my other question. And I believe you said you were gonna have markers uh, to show six feet apart if I am correct on that. Correct. Are, and also, go ahead. I was going to say, also, we were letting people bring their own food, so I don't know that every car would potentially go to the food truck, because um, people can bring their own candy, popcorn, you know, whatever, eat at their own vehicle um, if they want. And we are looking at two to three food trucks. Gotcha. And then, would you be making any type of um, announcement while while there? I, I don't know. I don't know if you're having like a microphone or, or how that would be set up to just encourage people to not be congregating, to stay in their cars with the movie um, and stuff, you know, unless they're getting food and then going back to the car. Again, I'm just trying to think of safety and precaution. Yeah, we do have a microphone and uh, Sherry at the beginning of the night um, is gonna make several announcements and we can mention that as well. Yeah, that, I, I think that would be helpful to encourage people to stay in their cars um, and discourage uh, congregating. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I I agree with Supervisor Hens. Is that and then if you hand out sand, we require masks. Most people are going to do that then, right? And and probably the rest of the people are not going to be a problem. I I I understand you setting your boundaries for your private property. So uh, I I saw up to 500 people you were hoping attended and in your prospectus, and I was just really impressed. Okay. I do um, have one question. Oh, sure. I'm done. Yep. Thank you. Um, does the applicant will monitor the weather and make a decision on how to respond to a severe weather event? What are your options in terms of responding? Uh, do you have some, how far are you from a shelter? Yeah, in the proposal we sent um, planning and development, um, there is a machine shed on our property. Um, and that will be a shelter area if needed. So that doesn't have a basement. That's a pool building? Correct, no basement. But we're gonna be monitoring the weather closely prior to the event starting. And then how would you call it off if you needed to? Yeah, if we need to make an announcement to take shelter or a storm's coming in, again, we'll have use of that microphone, our volunteers, um, and we'll get the message spread. And we can post it on Facebook where we're going to um, advertise the event as well as, you know, reach out to people in the community, letting them know that, you know, it's been canceled if that is the case. That, that's what I was thinking more than, you know, more than if, you know, it looked like the weather was going to be bad, but the event hasn't started yet, it's an hour or so away. If you had some way in your advanced materials to say, if there's possibly um, adverse weather conditions, check this Facebook page. Okay. Um, it would be nice if you had some place that was little better for a tornado um, situation than a machine shed, but that at least gets people on some of the bad weather. Okay, I have no further questions. Any, any others come to mind? In that case, I would entertain a motion regarding the uh, Special event application for Flicks on Farm. I'll make that. Or this is. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, this is Amelia. I was just going to suggest that if you wanted to add in any of those social distancing um, recommendations or mask requirements as conditions, um, you could do so. Sorry yes. to interrupt. The conditions are, um, yeah, the conditions right now do not include anything about the masks. So. Right, so so it's, my motion would be to approve the special events application for Flicks on the Farm with uh, uh, um, 
information being provided that face coverings or that would be uh, required um, on any promotional information and that there be an announcement to encourage social distancing, um, staying in your car, social distancing when outside of the car, so to minimize any type of congregation of individuals. Um, plus the conditions approved by planning and development. Did I capture everything? Yep. I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, Hedens? Aye. <coughs> aye. Merkin, aye. This is approved. Congratulations on doing such a good job and thank you for um, being flexible. We appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Good luck with it. Now, uh, more um, item here discussion consideration recommendations from the Board of Health. I think this might take some discussion. I would, uh, is everybody okay with a five minute break? I think mean, that's a really good idea. Yay. Okay. okay. We'll be back in five minutes. Okay, we're all back. So we're back in session and we're going on to agenda item eight under additional items, discussion and consideration of recommendation from Story County Board of Health for the Story County Board of Supervisors to require universal face coverings in public and for consideration of resolution 21.11 on resolution, uh, resolution requesting authority from the governor to enact localized responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, Supervisor Hutton, are you gonna start us out? I can, so the, the board help? Sure. Um, I, uh, so the Board of Health met on Friday. Yes, I have to go back to my week. Actually, they met on Tuesday with their initial and had their discussions in regards to face coverings um, and then met again on Friday to um, uh, uh, kind of review and um, make clear and do uh, a, a final uh, proposal. Um, one of the things that they do have um, are asking for um, the county and municipalities to adopt a resolution regarding a mask or face coverings. And they provided information in regards to some guidance as to what to include in their, um, in that proposal. Um, it's actually just- So well, that's a resolution to require, okay? Because I think we need to make clear we've actually got two resolutions. One only one got listed on the agenda, but they're actually asking us for a mandate. They don't really care what form it's in, right? I believe so. Well, they do have in their appendix it references a resolution. Okay. And yes, um, is what they're doing. I see that Molly Lee is on the line uh, with the Board of Health. Um, she may have some additional comments that she might uh, like to make or some additions on um, uh, the proposal from the Board of Health, um, but they were really looking at, again, how to mitigate uh, the spread of COVID-19 and what control uh, that we have in order to um, uh, get this under control. Um, I guess I would say is there, was there kind of their discussions in regards to, but, uh, and can you clarify here when you say what control, because that's a separate issue, right? Yeah, it is not, uh, yes. It doesn't, it, it isn't addressed in their letter. No, no, I mean, it was It was part of their recommendations of saying, overall, the information they have received from like the CDC and other areas, one way to control the spread is the face covering. Okay. Right, that is, what I, that is what I meant. So thank you for seeking that clarification. Um, Yes, their initial uh, request is, uh, is was subjected, subject was face coverings resolution. And their first paragraph says, the Story County Board of Health is asking all municipalities across Story County to adopt a face covering resolution. Current research strongly suggests that requiring face covering use in public places could be among the most powerful tools to stop the community spread of COVID-19. That is their very first paragraph in their 
in their letter. If you want me to read the entire letter, I certainly can do no. so, but I think you've got access to that that was on Friday's Board of Health agenda. Um, and then they provide with that agenda the recommended face, recommended face covering guidance um, to provide for those, uh, the county or these municipalities in developing their resolution. They gave some suggestions for inclusion. Yeah. So that's my comment there. As I said, I believe Molly Lee is still on the um, the line uh, yeah, as part of the discussion as well. So I don't know if she had anything to add from my overview or not. And I don't know if she's still on. Oh, well, she, she was on and she might yeah. have gotten. She was. So I also want to add this at the beginning here as part, well, actually I'll wait as we go into our discussion. I'll just leave it at that for right at the moment. Okay, so knowing that this uh, recommend, that, that this letter was uh, being worked on and going to be coming to the Board of Supervisors, um, uh, I volunteered or took it upon myself, I guess, how do you want to look at both, all right, to research more information. Um, particularly about what Johnson County had done and the approach they'd taken. Also, I had seen an opinion by an agent attorney that I know who had a, had an opinion contrary to the attorney general's um, uh, statements uh, that only the governor and Iowa Public Health could um, enact uh, or, or uh, do a face ordinance and that and I'm sorry I'm summarizing it very 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 shortly okay and maybe not correctly from an attorney standpoint of view but anyway so I went out and with my own funds uh, paid for a, an opinion from uh, this attorney uh, Abe's attorney Frank Fieldmeyer to include it in I also talked to Johnson County uh, supervisor to learn more about their process and what they went through and I'm just going to say at this particular point in time that, uh, you know, it appears to be it's the battle of the attorneys. Okay. Uh, and then taking the fact, knowing that the Board of Health was going to um, uh, issue some, looking at issuing some kind of letter, I started work on a resolution, which is attached in there as resolution draft two. And it is, uh, was very much based upon what uh, it appeared the Board of Health was going to recommend with their recommendations. Also, uh, I was provided with a couple of other documents for some wording in the whereas part justifications. Uh, I put in a couple of items myself and then also uh, copied heavily from the Johnson County. Um, uh, resolution. The key thing that I think has come up that will be discussed here more is that process, depending on what we, the board, decide to do, um, process may have to be um, go back a couple of steps because the Board of Health has asked for the local uh, jurisdictions and the county to pass resolutions, but their the intent is for those to make masks make uh, masks mandated. But actually, the approach that Johnson County used was to go in under a section of the code 137 that gives the local board or the county boards of health and local boards of health the ability to enact some, and enforce some, I think it's reasonable, it says, um, measures. Uh, and therefore, it's the Board of Health that would need to do the ordinance. And then the code very clearly lays out the process, which is that the Board of Health would do, would craft the ordinance. The Board of Health would hold a public hearing. The Board of Health would vote. The Board of Health would refer it to the Board of Supervisors. The Board of Supervisors would then vote with a resolution, enact a resolution, to put that ordinance into play. And that's the process that would have to go through. And so um, 
uh, if that's the direction that um, the supervisors would ask the Board of Health to take. And so that is included in resolution draft two in, under the therefores of my, of my, of my memo. It just, it, it doesn't lay out every single step. It just says the Board of Health do the ordinance and have a public hearing. Okay, and then with us, and then the Board of Supervisors after we adopted a resolution would be responsible then for final publication of notice to the public. So, so the, what the Board of Health has asked was assuming we could just pass a resolution and hey, it's done. But depending on which legal approach you look at, um, whether that would be viable or would defend, defendable, defensible, I'm sorry, okay, maybe that's the right word, would be which approach we might indicate we want them to take. So there really are a lot of layers here. There are many more layers than, than originally anticipated. And with that, I'll be quiet. I do, I, I want to state that I don't see Deb Shildrop on the line. She had, she had been on, she texted me and said, I just wanted you all to know right. that they lost power at City Hall. Oh. And so she had, she got bumped off Zoom because they lost right. power. She also wanted me to uh, uh, let the board know that this evening's city council meeting has been postponed until next Tuesday. Sure. Um, and that they'll have the same agenda uh -huh. and that they will have a special meeting this week to address bonds, but that's the only item for the special meeting. Just wanted you to know that, sure. that she planned to be on to listen, potentially make comment. I don't know, but so they're, they're bumped off with no problem. That's good to know because actually on tonight's agenda, the A city council agenda, there is um, a, re a staff report, and I, I did read it, okay? And it's about the, their uh, staff and city attorney's recommendation based upon the fact about if they enacted an ordinance, what it would take to trigger enacting that ordinance from the staff's recommendation. So that's a whole level we're not approaching here. But yeah, I did read that also. Okay, so uh, I don't know that it, it interrupts um, or, or factors into any process we may want to start give, if we decide to go down a road. But we have to decide, I think, which road we want to go down. Right, right. No, I don't, I don't disagree. Any I, just road want to make, go I just want to make sure you're aware since yes. she has been on uh, and no longer can't participate. Yeah, no, that's about yeah. the situation. That's not good news for City Hall or maybe downtown East, but anyway. And I would simply add to that this that since we were talking about what direction were we, were we going to take, I mean, that several jurisdictions had also asked the governor to um, allow to revise her latest uh, declaration of emergency and, and allow. Uh, local responses to the pandemic. In other words, um, kind of getting past the attorney general's opinion and the opinions of some county attorneys and, and city attorneys even who have said that um, in a public health emergency, the governor has retained the authority unless she delegates it. So I thought another option, another thing we could do is do something that the city of Ames has done and I believe Lynn County has also done. In fact, I actually used a lot of their, um, mm -hmm. their resolution to just say, we could do that. We could say, Governor, we also ask that you reconsider. Um, so that's another option. I don't think that's that, you know, I don't think we, any of these are mutually exclusive. Right. I agree. I I really think that your your resolution there to go to the governor is a great one. I mean, you know, is good and well worded or whatever. I'm, I'm yes. quite disappointed that she has not, uh, as most of her fellow governors have done, uh, done a statewide mandate. And I've talked to people lately who've traveled in other states and talk about how well it, it works and how seriously some of those states seem to be taking it. So I just thought, well, maybe she needs to hear from more more local governments that we're up to this challenge if she's not. 
I actually, along that line, thought, well, you know, um, yeah, because they're not mutually exclusive. We could do both. We could do one today and work on the other one or whatever, right? I thought, well, geez, maybe we pass it and then we get in the car and drive it down. <laughs> so, but, but we don't have an appointment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But no. So, so we're, what is, can I ask some questions? Yes, absolutely. One I mean, of the things I'm hearing, Loris, you're suggesting is the Board of Health would draft the ordinance under their authority and it's Chapter 137, correct? Correct. And then that would, let me ask, uh -huh. would they have assistance from the county attorney in drafting an ordinance? I think you have to ask the, the county attorney. That's office why I brought it thing. up. Yeah. I see both Tim Mills and Anderson are on the phone. So, would, would one of you care to answer my question? Hi, Jim. Yes. Yes, can't hear you. You're unmuted, but we're having trouble hearing you. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm uh I'm here with Tim. Okay. I'm I'm here with Tim Meals in his office. And uh so, would your office be able to assist the Board of Health in drafting an ordinance? Yeah, absolutely we could absolutely help drafting an ordinance. The, the concern is it wouldn't be legally enforceable until such time the governor waives the proclamation or allows localities to take take action. So we can draft an ordinance and we can have it sit until such time as we need it. But uh, at this point, it would be unenforceable. It wouldn't be something that our office would, would want the, the board to do. So let me ask the follow up to this, Ethan, okay? Because it is your and Tim's opinion that you share with the Attorney General's office that the governor's uh, authority, governor in Iowa Public Health under 135, section 135, have the, that have the authority and we don't have it. So the next step on this is you could help draft. What if the Board of Health and the Board of Supervisors voted though to go ahead with uh, trying 137, trying to, to follow the path that Johnson County did with under 137. Next question is, would you, in the County District Attorney's Office, represent us and adopt the arguments that would make that successful to argue against the AG, or would we need to go for outside counsel? So what you have here is a series of code sections that we've been familiar with more so this year than ever before but these code sections we've been reviewing since february 137 135 29c um, 331 301 we're all familiar with these code sections by now and in matters of a statewide concern we want to look to the ag's expertise so what you'd be asking us to do is say ignore your prior opinion declare that the ag's interpretation is wrong and go down a path that leads towards enforcement which law enforcement would seem to be uncomfortable doing and we can't advise you to do that um, okay. our advice has been our advice so there's there's inherent risk in going against the state and Attorney General Tom Miller. Um, the risk is somebody could be cited under this under this code section or this new ordinance. They could file a 1983 action. We could be on the hook for attorney's fees. There's lots of lots of risk here, and there's there's the issues about enforcement that are at the end of the road here. That's an officer standing before a citizen and giving them a citation or other interaction. And we, we don't believe that's permitted under 29C and 135. Can I ask a question? In terms of enforcement. Um, and I don't know that I've ever really gotten an answer to this. 
question. Who or what area would a county ordinance cover? If, if the Board of Health drafted an ordinance, let's just say the Board of Health drafted the ordinance, supervisors adapted a resolution for, um, approving that ordinance or adopting that ordinance, would it cover people in the unincorporated areas? And would it also cover people in the incorporated areas? That, that's a very good question. I think looking at the administrative code for guidance, administrative code 641-77.1, that the local board of health shall have jurisdiction over public health matters within its designated geographic area in accordance with Iowa Code Chapter 137. 137, oh. 103 says that the Story County, the County Board of Health shall have jurisdiction over the county. So I would imagine cities are within that geographic area. Okay, then my follow up question to that. Assuming this happens then, and it covers every place and everybody in Story County, the county ordinance, who enforces it? Does the county enforce it in the unincorporated areas and in those counties and those cities where we do contract law enforcement? And then do the four cities, one, two, three, four cities, that have their own law enforcement enforce it in their incorporated areas? That'd be my understanding, yes. So we would, so we, the, the County Board of Health and the County Supervisors would be passing an ordinance that as well as the Sheriff, that city law enforcement would be, would be to enforce. That'd be correct, but under, under home rule, an argument could be made that the cities could pass their own ordinance that supersede the county ordinance. Okay. For instance, I would imagine a city could pass an ordinance saying we don't have a mask policy and that would supersede the county ordinance. I think an argument can be made under that, under a reading of uh, Mr. Fielmeyer's opinion. So we could end up with I don't know a better way to put it. Jurisdictions fighting over what the ordinance would be in their areas. Yes. Yeah, again, and that's a very good point to make because that's that's essentially the argument the AG is making and that we've been making, and that is that in a public health disaster, the legislature has set forth Iowa Code 29C and 135 that gives the power to the state and to the Iowa Department of Public Health to coordinate the response. That's why that's why it needs to be a statewide issue. And that's why we want to defer to the expertise of the AG, not only because it's the AG's opinion, but also because we believe that's the right opinion. So if the governor were to allow local jurisdictions to adopt ordinances here, this is leading. Okay, I'll say it. Wouldn't it make sense for the local jurisdictions within a county to work together? To yes, that's, a, that's, a, that's, I think the administrative code imagines that when they talk about um, under that administrative code section, assurances and local decision makers, policy makers working together. And I'd wanna see a lot of that activity probably happen at the board of health level before they bring the board of supervisors a final product on an ordinance. Because again, enforcement depends upon community buy-in and community support. And uh, yeah, if the governor allows us that opening, that's a great way to do it. What's that administrative rule specifically? Is that still under that 641.77 or is that another rule where it talks about the board yeah, of health? Yeah, it's the um, 641-77.3. Thank you. And it occurred, yeah. Seven, open parent, three, close parent.
So Ethan, uh, this is, is uh, Supervisor Olson Flores again. So can you come back to risks because that's a, a great concern, right? That in, in anything that we do, we've got risks all over the place here, no matter what we do. But from the risks, when you said people could be cited, are you talking about, yes, members of the public could be cited or the Board of Supervisors could be cited or the Board of Health? That would be member of the public. As I as I interpret the Johnson County ordinance, it's a hundred five dollar uh, hundred five dollar fine, uh, civil penalty for violation of the ordinance. Okay. That's, and that's then, okay. And and then if that were the option that we ended up pursuing, uh, given the fact that you and, and County Attorney Meals have said no, we don't think this is the right interpretation of the law. Which is why I said earlier this is kind of getting to be a battle of the a battle of the attorneys in some ways, right? Is that and you drafted one, but you would and let's say that we lost in court, okay? So you're saying that we would have to pay people's fees, correct? That we would have to pick up the cost of the lawsuit for both sides? Is that what you're saying? No, I mean back to your Back the way you phrased the question, I, I don't believe okay. this is a battle. I don't believe this is a battle of the attorneys. Uh, okay. we've, given our, we've given our opinion. That's what our opinion is, and it's the majority opinion across the state of Iowa. Okay. That's, uh, right. You have you have hundreds of AGs. You have thousands of years of experience in those AGs arriving at that conclusion on issues of statewide concern. So okay. yeah, back to the inherent risks. It's completely speculative, but not beyond the realm of imagination that someone would want to challenge the ordinance. This someone would come to Story County with the intent of getting cited. They could then file a 1983 action or other, some other civil rights type, type claim, and the prevailing party in those claims under the legislation, under the statute, is entitled to attorney fees. So I'm just saying there's a risk here that that is attendant on us, and that's factored into our decision making. Yes, and it's punitive damages, not actual damages, right? Right. In 1982, punitive damages can be significant. And would our would we even be would we the county even be covered under our insurance? No, we're not operating in good faith. That's what I want to hear from you. Well, at this point, you have written opinion from your attorney. Yes. That agrees uh -huh. with the Ames City Attorney, that agrees with the AG's office. And you would be going on a minority position from one other attorney to go down this road following Johnson County's attorney. Okay, I and can't, that's why I'm asking. I cannot advise. I cannot advise the board to do that. Okay, but one uh, one of the things as I was as just coming on the board is that I was I was given information uh, about that as long as we're acting in good faith and Supervisor Murphy just said this as long as we the Story County Supervisors are acting in good faith including having the ability to go contrary to an attorney legal opinion we are covered and i'm asking is the county then covered if we're really in good faith acting in what we think is the best interest of the citizens are we covered or would the county have to pay for this out of the general fund so these will be interesting discussions because you have a situation I, where, these are interesting discussions because you have a situation right now where the board did not solicit this opinion an individual member of the board solicited the opinion. You would be acting yeah. under the opinion of the county attorney who is required by code under 331 756 7 to give this opinion. So you would be going contrary to the county attorney's opinion. Okay. Now, if the board elected as a group to go and get an outside opinion, I still think you'd have the issue of dealing with the fact that there was an opinion from the county attorney saying, Contrary. I don't know. I don't know how this that situation would play out. It, it's speculation at this point. 
Okay, well, I appreciate it though. I appreciate you pointing that out of speculation and laying out what the various factors are. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Ethan, this is Lisa. And uh, I haven't uh, brought up as many questions because I think I've gone through some of these questions over the last several months with the Board of Health, uh, which you've been a part of as well. One of my questions though, or comments is, I believe I've come to you on numerous occasions um, getting um, an interpretation from the AG's office kind of on different scenarios related to masks or other situations with this pandemic. And it is, if I recall correctly, each time it has come back to us is that um, it is under the governor's authority. That is, seems like that's been a consistent response by Heather Adams from the AG's office. Am I correct on that, Ethan? Yeah, you're what you're 100 correct, and I respect people like Heather Adams. I respect people like Mike Bennett. I also respect people like Mark Lambert and Frank Fieldmeyer. I respect all these people as attorneys, but you have to look to the AG's office. Their job is to interpret these issues of statewide concern, and that that's that's their daily job. And um, as I said earlier, we didn't really think about these code sections until February in any great depth. And the more we look at it, the more we do conclude that the AG got it right. I mean, I'm not in a position to tell Heather Adams, no, you're wrong, Heather, I think you're wrong. I think she's, I think she's interpreted correctly. What other questions do we have of uh, Ethan or Jim? I don't. I once again, uh, this is Laura's supervisor. Also. I really want to thank um, uh, Ethan and Tim for, you know, providing it work. Uh, Mark Lambert, I read all his, I read everything that was provided. And, uh, and also Frank for doing that, which is why I, uh, uh, I felt that we needed to know what the reasonings were, uh, you know, for him putting out the opinion column that he did put out. And, uh, so just thank you to everybody for the work. I believe everyone is trying to give advice that is in the best interest of the citizens, um, you know, as from their perspective and what their jobs are and what, and what their jobs and the parameters of the jobs are. So thank you. I just want to say that before we move, go any further. Yeah, and I would agree. I, you know, thank you, Ethan and Tim, for all of your, I think you fielded a number of questions from the three of us, either collectively at the table today or in previous sessions, certainly individually. Um, I know you've responded to numerous questions that I have had. Um, this is not an easy thing to figure out, um, but I appreciate that, um, that the detail you provided back to us um, uh, uh, and the information seems relatively consistent throughout this whole process. Because I know each time the governor has redone a, a, her proclamation or extended it out, I've usually contacted Ethan right away and say, okay, <laughs> did she do anything different here? Um, what type of authority did she include in? Um, and thank you for um, the additional information that you continually provide. And I'm sure you will be providing as we go on during this lengthy pandemic. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, board. And Ethan, was there, let me just add, was there anything else that you wanted to say before we discuss? No, I think obviously you can say this sincerely and heartfelt that everyone cares. That's why we're here today. As attorneys, we're constrained by the law and we have to advise you on what we think the law permits. But I think the example from Lynn County, what you prepared, Supervisor Merkin, is, is a good way to go about this. If enough counties can send enough requests to the governor to do something, that, that's the way to do this, to have her delegate her authority to localities. At the same time, Ethan, I would say we're not in control of what the governor does and we can try to persuade, but at some point we may just say, 
we're we're not getting anywhere. I, I just need to say that. No, I appreciate you saying that, Linda. I want to take us back to, July, I think, July 24th. Um, it was a Friday morning, and the governor's proclamation was due to expire on the 25th, and which was a Saturday. And so I uh, just sent out a ministerial-only email to many people, including, I think, uh, Ethan and Tim, and just said, hey, has anybody started working on a draft of what we would need to do if she all of a sudden doesn't extend her proclamation and we have nothing okay you know so 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 um so so that that this has been on our minds for a while and, and then lisa uh, supervisor heads pointed out that the month before when she extended she only extended a few hours before her proclamation was ready to expire so none of this discussion wherever we end up is really going to be just a kind of a i think you guys use the term of academic exercise we need to be prepared regardless of what we decide to go forward as far as you know if she decides that's it we're done with this we also have i think from a from the standpoint of we're watching people walk around without masks on and not social distance all of us are and so the frustration is how's the best way to deal with this so that there aren't more COVID cases um uh, the board of health and their letter says saving lives i i would kind of flip it the opposite way and say we're trying to prevent deaths so you know uh, on that, I think it's saving lives more with first responders, etc. But we are definitely trying to pro to prevent death. And whatever I think, I personally, whatever I'm doing here at this board table, this will be the most, I believe, truly significant thing that I will do in my four years. And I've made a lot of votes in four years, but but this is the one that can literally stop death, stop. Um, someone who does live from having very serious long-term complications for the rest of their life. Supervisor Hedman, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I really don't. I think, uh, going through the discussions here, just seeing the impact of, uh, you know, how it affects the residents of the county, um, just you know, to hear the stories of people who have um, dealt and hospitalized with COVID-19 and um, the length of time it's taking for recovery and I don't mean full recovery necessarily but just recovery where they don't feel so exhausted um, you know that they could go back to work um, I think a science medical profession are still an ongoing to learn about the longer effects of individuals who have not only been diagnosed positive, but have been hospitalized and maybe on a ventilator and all that type of impact. Um, uh, I concur with, with both of you. We've both seen, we've all seen where you go. There's some people that wear masks and some people that don't. Um, uh, I've often said that, uh, you know, I haven't hugged my son since March. Uh, uh, from the group home that he lives in and the precautions that they are taking but you know if he's healthy and he's safe. So that's my number one priority. I am wishing that we could do so much more. Uh, but I, but um, I also recognize that there are some limitations. I'm not a physician, so there's not things that I can that I can do from that you know perspective when I say of doing more. And I'm not an attorney, um, so there's things I can't do from that <laughs> perspective uh, as well either. Um, I can I can go by the information that's provided me as a supervisor, um, and that's uh, that's our obligation. Um, let me just add a little bit more. I think you both have received emails, as have I, in the last few days since the Torn Register article regarding whether or not people were for or against mask mandates. I did receive a call. I I was asked to. Um, pass this on to you, so I will. I received a call about 10 minutes before our meeting started with Stacy and Brad Powers, and they said they just simply didn't have time to call in. 
because they, like most of us, have um, kind of a mess at home, you know, have some damages and right. doing that. But they wanted me to, they wanted to kind of weigh in as being against mass mandates. So I said I would, I would pass that on to make sure that you both knew that as well. Um, I, I think it's been several people for, several people against. Um, um, and I think it's something that people have strong feelings about. We've noticed that, we've seen that, there's very strong feelings about that. Um, I've, I've tried to read everything that people have sent me, and I've also read um, a lot of other things, and I've kind of come to the conclusion that right now, given the spread we have in our communities, that wearing face coverings is one of, one of the things that everybody can contribute to to help uh, slow the spread of the pandemic. Um, and it's also one of the best tools we have. Um, we had somebody talk about contact tracing earlier and I really, really appreciated his remarks because contact tracing, testing and contact tracing are supposed to be the gold standards of public health. Unfortunately, we've never gotten it, we haven't gotten it right in this country. That's the problem. And I, I, I am very distraught about that fact that there were means within our control or our government's control that could have made a difference that were not, were not done. But that's in the past now, this is where we are. We have way too many cases, you know, according to some experts, even think contact tracing, it, it, it would have to be so ramped up with the spread. I really respect and admire Iowa State for say, taking on that responsibility of doing contact tracing for their students and their faculty as people are returning to Ames. I think that was, I think that's commendable. They hired 50 people and part-time people. So I don't know how that really relates to the ratio that Galen was talking about, but I think they did a really, they're doing a really good job of that and the testing. Um, they're doing what they can. Nevertheless, we're in a situation now. Two thirds of our county's population is in Ames. Nearly half of that is on is Iowa State students. About 9,700 in the dorms, about 20,000 they're expecting to live off campus. What we've seen so far, just testing about 3,000 last week, 2.2% tested positive. 2.2% doesn't have sound like a lot, but that was 66. If of all the students that come back, 2.2% test positive, that's 606. Added new cases added to our community. And what we have right now is a situation where if you are on campus, you're required to wear a facial covering. The minute you leave the campus, you are not required. We're encouraged, we have cyclones care, we have a good, a good um, public relations, a good, a good awareness campaign that is being funded, that has been, a lot of people put time into, but it's voluntary. I can't help but think the students see that difference. You know, that's, and, and I'm not gonna, and the majority probably will do the right thing. The majority will probably do the right thing, but it's the ones who say, Oh, I have to wear, who do it simple. I have to wear a face covering when I'm on the campus. I don't have to when I'm off campus that are gonna be the concern. So I'm frustrated about that. I'm, I, at the same time, I look at what Ethan says and yes, section 1983 of the Civil Rights Act, 1871. You could, you know, we, we need to be careful in how we do this because we, you know, we need to not jeopardize the county right. in this. So that's why I drafted the resolution to request the authority from the governor. I know she's been asked by other jurisdictions. I think we need to get our name in there too and we need to say, and, and basically to say why. And that's why I tried to personalize it with what our, what our Story County situation is. And that's what local control is all about, is responding to local situations and doing the best you can to protect your public. And that's, I believe, what we're trying to do. 
I know there are people who will not agree with us if we eventually get to a, a face covering requirement. I know that. We're not there yet anyway, I don't think. I think we're at the point of trying, you know, one more time with the governor to see what we can what we can get done on this. So I would I would hope that and I also don't think these are mutually exclusive. Right. I think it would be possible to work on an ordinance, not saying we're bound and determined, but so we have an ordinance ready that would be the best ordinance, you know, that it would be consistent with how we write county ordinances and we have the best ordinance we could write in the most defensible. And then let's see what happens in the next week or two. Let's see if, the, if you know, if we can persuade the governor and maybe have talk with other counties about persuading the governor. I think Ethan makes a good point though that if we do something in Story County, we need to do it jointly with the other jurisdictions. I, I would feel, because I think it is going to be difficult for law enforcement. If we end up with face coverings mandated, we're putting law enforcement in a difficult situation. And I, I don't want to do that, but I also don't want to presume and put another jurisdiction's law enforcement in the situation without that being what they want to do or putting them in the, in the position of having to say, well, we're going to reject Story County's ordinance. I, I just don't think that's, I just don't think that behooves us. I mean, it, it doesn't sound, I mean, we have a really good tradition in Story County of our local jurisdictional executives, mayors, um, supervisors, and Iowa State working together. Let's not jeopardize that. So I am, I, I am, agree with our basic approach. I, I agree what you're saying, Linda, is while we all know that there are people out there breathing on each other today, okay, we can't do anything about that because, all right, so um, I like us going down there, you know, let's do passing this year proclamation or your request, or sorry, the resolution request, saying please read this up for us. And at the same time, we start taking on the steps about when she does it, all right? Um, Working with the juris, the other local jurisdictions, I agree with, and I think we need to like start that when we get done this after after we're done with this meeting. Uh, I did in listening in to the Ames City Council meeting a few weeks ago as they were discussing this issue. I heard one council person say that well, we want to do our own. We don't want the count to do to it the county to do it. And I called that city council member late the, the next day, I think afterwards and said, boy, that sure was emotional what you said. Did you, can you share with me, do, you know, do, uh, what have we done wrong? And he said, oh, no, no, no. I just think that it should, it should be us. So we're going to need to work on that. And that was expressed in an open meeting. You can go watch that video. Okay. So we do need to work on that. And I think then as we will go forward with um, our, with, if our attorneys are going to help draft, are going to draft it, okay, of what we may not enact before the governor or not, but then um, we'll just have to work with them, I guess. I heard them say, since I'm the only one who requested the opinion and just released it as in the public domain, that we, if we need to then vote at some point to get that same opinion for all three of us. I, I don't know. I mean, I heard that. We've got a lot of steps to go here, but I think we need to start working on the steps starting this afternoon. So, so are we considering the resolution now, yeah. the governor? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I, I think so, and I do think that uh, whatever the path takes us, future-wise, um, uh, uh, Ethan and Tim have made it very clear their opinion, right, on it, um, and and the reasoning on it, which are really pretty quite compelling. Um, in fact, uh, uh, at least uh, for me, um, what does happen if more counties or other jurisdictions request, I don't know how many letters the, the governor has received from other cities or counties, right. you know, to know, is it 10 or has she received, you know, 50 or more? I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, will that get her to move at all or not? I don't think it hurts to have something drafted or beginning to work on 
it doesn't mean that anyone's voting yay or nay or anything on it at that time. But it gives you an opportunity to get something kind of in the streamline so that we can look at whatever. Now, the question is, is this something that the Board of Health then will need to, to do and they need to begin working on themselves as the Board of Health? Right. If, if you're nodding your head, it sounds like that way in consultation with the county attorney's office, but knowing, I mean, clearly knowing that what they draft up <clears throat> kind of sounds like would not be something that could be implemented right away. It would potentially would have to be uh, based on our county attorney's office of, or his recommendations that if you have something in ready or drafted up would be once the governor gives the authority to implement. So uh, that's just one, one thing, just so that they understand or that you have to do something in consultation with the, or us collectively with the other jurisdictions. As Ethan said, you could pass, pass something kind of wise within those locals to do a resolution overturning. That is my concern. And do you have to be competing against each other or not? Well, and that's, and that's back to where my characterization Ethan disagrees with about attorneys versus attorneys. And what do we even need to do to protect the county? I, I mean, we got to get, make some decisions at this table about what steps do we think will be best. And that includes covering the county. And I, and I just like us not, I'd like us to seriously consider that as it moves forward with the Board of Health drafting and whatever, that we are going to be able, if we are, if we decide we have got to kick, that the governor's not going to do anything. Linda said a week or two, right? And that's a very short period of time. I just counted out if we had decided to go down the path of Johnson County as of today, all right, we'd have to, um, as I was uh, went in and talked to Shelly about this also, so to get publication for the Board of Health, they'd have to schedule a special meeting, Board of Health would, to finalize whatever they want their ordinance to say, all right? So then to go ahead and have a public hearing on what they do with, from another special meeting, they'd have to get it to the paper on a Thursday. So if the Board of Health, the earliest something would even happen is if the Board of Health would meet tomorrow, uh, they probably couldn't even, they'd have to work Thursday morning, finalize what they want an ordinance to say. <coughs> I'm just saying this is the absolute, and I don't think anybody can make these deadlines. All right. Then it'd have to go to the paper to publish about the hearing. And then the earliest they could have a hearing would be on a, a, apparently four days after, or it would publish then on the 20th. Because we two of our papers are not daily papers, they publish every Thursday, all right? So then it would publish on the 20th. So it has to be at least four days after before you have the public hearing. That takes you to Tuesday the 25th. And then it would have to, from the Board of Health, would have to, if they voted to pass it, it would have to refer it over to us. So the earliest we could even do our first uh, next step would be the 28th on Friday of August. So we're headed into September. Oh, Shelly's raising her hand. Yes, Shelly. Three readings for the ordinance. Three readings for an ordinance. Two. At least two. Okay, so then, all right, we'd have to do the 28th. And Shelly, do we have to have so many days in between readings? No, usually it's just. Yeah, well, we usually do it every Tuesday, but I'm saying right. that, okay. So then we're at Friday because we have a second reading the following Tuesday. The following Tuesday. I don't, I. Okay, well, as far as you know, yeah. we don't know. But it could be, it could be Tuesday the 1st, September 1st, or it could even jump later to September 8th. So, so all of this is just to get an ordinance in place on 137, whether or not the governor does anything. Also included in there per Ethan is that based upon protecting the county and the fact that they would, the, our attorneys have a different opinion that the whole board would have to vote to get a separate opinion and then we'd have to vote a minority of, and then we'd have to vote to go against their opinion, which would be occurring during that same point. Well, so, so we're, 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 we
is sought out compared to our county attorney. Correct. Yeah. Yes. I just want to clarify. Yeah. Right. Our county attorney right. has been pretty good. Yes, our county attorney has been consistent. I'm just trying to say, even then, if we decide. Well, and then it's also, even with this information that you sent spoke about today, all of right. This, of providing that to the Board of Health, and even if the Board of Health would want to go down that road. Correct. Knowing that you've got some inherent risk and the consistent information that the our, our county attorney's office has provided not only to us but to the board of health the entire time so it's a process it's, it's a gonna process. take some time yeah i'm gonna just i just thought of something and i probably totally inappropriate to share it but i'm gonna show oh good make us laugh <laughs> and uh when i quit smoking cigarettes was the year that the legislature banned cigarettes uh, that ban or that law was in a couple of places. The law was not going to go into effect until July 1. I quit smoking in April because I knew it was coming. And I said, well, I better, I better start, you know, get rid of the bad habit. You know, maybe somebody look at this. I mean, this it, it's going to be in the paper. You know, we've got a reporter here right now. It's going to be in the paper that we're considering. We may consider this, yes. So... I, I don't think that, I think that some of the value of this is that people know that it's being seriously considered here and it's being seriously considered for good reasons. Uh -huh. I think that that is as useful in encouraging and persuading people that they should be wearing face coverings and maybe as good as any penalties we ever put in anything. So, yeah. I think I think we I, I'm not I'm not there's some work here and there's some hearings on I'm I'm not deterred by how long it would take to get an ordinance if that's the way we end up going. And I just want yeah, I'm doing this in part for the public too, because to understand we just don't get to do say, hey, we're gonna do a revolution today. There's a draft on there just so there was some starting point if we want to get that deep in today, which I don't think we want to. Right. The, the yeah. one thing though that does concern me about this is the, the discussion about the other entities. And maybe the public hearing is the way to hear from them. You know, also for the Board of Health to get feedback from the other public entities that this work and make sure that everybody's on the same page. And at first I was thinking, oh, we should do some input, they should do some input process ahead of time. I said, well, like the input process is built in because there's the public hearing. So that's the other advantage is is it we can be talking to the other jurisdictions, they can be involved in that public hearing, and it can be very clear that we're not just operating, you know, the Board of Health right. is seeking that input, they're not just operating on their own and saying we're going to, you know. So we can even, on that public hearing with the Board of Health taking the lead into our ordinance, but I don't think there's anything that prevents us, the Board of Supervisors, to be there and, or even to have a joint meeting. Right, so that we can say we had a hearing too. I mean, you know, this is, and that does mean probably something at night or whatever. I don't, you know, we're not required if you go down 137, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you've got our normal ordinance process, right? Which is, which is where, for Tim and Ethan, I guess, you know, would be in the event that we don't um, wait, or that we do wait until the governor does something, right? But. Tim, uh, Ethan, we could still use 137 if even if tomorrow the governor said, hey, that's it. Uh, yeah, everybody can do their own local thing. We still might be better off doing 137, correct? Yeah, I think, yeah, it makes the most sense. Okay, thanks. Okay, where are we ready to uh, take some action? I've got an LO down here, which I think is me to make the motion on the proclamation or the the uh, resolution to go to the governor requesting. Here, my twenty one eleven. Thank you. My computer went to sleep. What okay. happened to twenty one ten? It was taken by somebody else. It was, and one hundred nine is still in place. Oh, so no, I'm just the one you've got. So, okay. Yeah. So, so I'm going to make a motion that we approve uh, resolution twenty one eleven which is the uh, request to the governor to please allow local jurisdictions to enact what they feel is appropriate. Okay. I, would, I would second. Okay. okay. 
had a lot of discussion. Is there any more? I just have one question on the proclamation because the bottom of mine seems a little. Did you have any statistical numbers that would need to be updated? Uh, just because my last line is kind of cut off, and I just want to make sure. On August seventh, on the August, where it says twenty twenty two twenty two percent of the three thousand. Uh, no, no, I've not seen anything from Iowa State okay. since that. Okay, that, that would be my only information that that was updated, but as I said, mine was a little cut off, so I did yeah. not, no. did, couldn't read what that, that was. was so. That was the, I, yeah. No, that's fine. I wrote it, I think, on the A, and I have not, I've been looking, I have not seen any more numbers from Iowa State. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, so then we're ready for the vote. Olson? Aye. Heaven. Aye. Merkin, aye. Resolution is adopted. Um, so then, I guess the next motion would seem to be what do we want to communicate to the Board of Health? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Um, I think the question comes down is, do we want the Board of Health to begin to draft an ordinance for consideration whenever I have no specific date that would be brought before us, but to start working on that. Also recognizing that they are a volunteer board right. and their time availability as well as our attorney's availability for input on that and even if they would want to do that so they would probably want to have discussion at their board meeting of whether they even want to go down so it would be a road. request right okay. right so i would move that we request our chair to uh, send a letter to the chair of the board of health um, as soon as possible requesting that the Board of Health uh, work with the Story County Attorney's Office to consider drafting an ordinance to require face coverings per um, Iowa Code 137. Once again, my, I don't know my computer was supposed to, but anyway, okay. Period. And then that goes to them and it's back in their ballpark. Ethan and Tim, is that are that is that good with you? Because we've not said that we're going to do anything with it. We're just asking them to start working on the ordinance. Yeah, that makes sense. Ethan again, I can't hear you. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, your, I just have a. Are you asking them to work on the ordinance or are you also asking them to consider what they want, whether they want to work on an ordinance? I accept that as a Shelly who wanted to die for lack of motion and have you start over. That would be yeah. okay. okay. All right. So here you here I'm gonna start over. Wait. Oh. Die for, a lack, die for lack of a second. Oh. I move that um, our chair addresses a letter to the chair of the Board of Health, uh, notifying them that of our discussion and requesting that they to consider, just that they consider drafting a uh, ordinance for face mask coverings um, per uh, section 137 of the code and that they work with our Story County Attorney's Office to do this. And that this letter from our chair go to the Board of Health as soon as possible. Is there a second? Yeah, yeah, but I, I'll, I'll second. It covers that they will discuss right. it. They'll make that decision with the county attorney's office and we'll advise them about how to write it. 
Code 130, 137 is the one that lays out the process and also their authority, okay? And that's, we're just asking and, you know, they're, yeah. And then, it's, uh, and then it's up to them to move it back or forward or whatever, but then we have a draft regardless of what comes next. Yeah, I, 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 I guess that my, my only struggle with all of this is that our county attorney has been very consistent in saying that we don't have the authority. I understand. And, that, and that's, that's, that's my hang up is we're asking them to do, and I, I get it, be prepared or something, but, but they, they, you're, they're asking them to do work potentially. Whether they want to take it on, they may say no, but you're kind of putting it out there saying, we want you to do this to determine if you want to do it. But oh, by the way, our county attorney's office doesn't believe this is. No, but if, if the governor removes her, if, if, okay, following the attorney's, the county, story county attorney's advice, if the governor all of a sudden says local can do it, can do it, then we're ready to go. And this would be what we're under. So even Ethan said, yeah, that works as long as they're only being asked to ask on a draft going forward. Okay, without us not doing anything. So if we will have to cross the next bridge, which would be if, if the governor doesn't do anything and things get worse and, you know, I mean, with this, we'll have to cross that bridge. We're just putting in motion, which is why I counted out how even if we start this today, sure. we're looking at people starting to, we're looking at September 8th at the earliest before any, any kind of enforcement would be done. So Linda's right, in the next month, what we're really doing here is saying, people, come on, start practicing wearing your mask, just in case, just in case, <laughs> sure. just in case, and it allows us to look at everybody else. Right, and, and I understand that. I look at it as purely, it's, it's unfortunately gotten political, but from a purely a health yeah. issue. Um, not only was I looking at, um, you know, the people that have emailed us, either for or opposed, um, looking back at some of the discussions and emails from the Board of Health meetings and some of the initiatives that they've put forth as well, um, and some of the misinformation uh, that, that has been provided or that folks have um, referenced. And I know I've certainly, there's been a few uh, journals from the Annals of Internal Medicine or the New England, um, the New England Journal of Med Medicine as well, that the citations of some of the emails of folks that have sent to me, if you go straight to those email or to those sites or whatever, they say they've been redacted. You know, and they say, well, the, or retracted, not redacted, retracted. Okay. And the reason being, um, is that people are misinterpreting what the articles were saying, thinking that, oh, you're saying not to do more masking when they were encouraging more masking. Okay. So my, my comments are in that I, I am agreeing with the fact that uh, sometimes when people, they don't have the right information, and sometimes if you put something out to say that this is in the process of looking at to potentially be able to have the opportunity to discuss and maybe implement at a future date through it, that we're making sure that we've got all um, more scientific, accurate information that we're going off of. Um, I think we are, but it's some of the information that's coming into us as well. Which is we have that time. Now. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, and that's, that's what I'm saying is, yes, I'm agreeing that this then provides us that time to make sure we've got all that accurate information should the Board of Health decide to go down that road and should the Board of Supervisors right. go down that road. So and Linda, that's what you were pretty much laying out also, right? I mean, you know, yeah. So. In my long-winded way. That's okay. No. <laughs> so what happens when you're here for three hours? Yeah. So those are the two things I, I personally so, thought needed to maybe. So we have a motion and a second. Do we have? Oh. We haven't voted yet, have we? No. No. <laughs> Any further yes, I got lost. Any further discussion? If not, Olson? Aye. And I. Merkin, aye. Resolution is passed. Thank you. Well, now, our motion, motion, no, the motion, motion is passed. No, it wasn't a resolution. Yeah. Okay. 
motion to adopt the resolution. No. No, we're on the motion for you to write a letter to the Board of Health. Um, it's okay. It's all right. Yeah. Three hours is too long for us. Okay. Got it. Motion carried. Then, thank you. Good discussion. Let's move on. Department reports, there are none. Other reports, there are none. Upcoming agenda items. Um, I'm going to suggest that at some point we should have a report on the CARES funding. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, Story County has received 1.2 million. It is only reimbursable, though. It's not a check that's written to us. It's got to be COVID-19 related. And it, I'm understanding also that it has to be not for an item that we already budgeted funds for. So Leanne and I think Sandra have a meeting on Wednesday to start working on that. So I'm just going to ask if you might be, you know, when you're, when you have got some more information, could you put an informational item on the agenda and give us some information? And, um, okay. And I think there are some things that, that we will end up needing to, to handle that we haven't yet gotten requests for, but might in the future that, that would be um, things that this money could be sent for. So that's all I've got. Um, I know that I've gotten uh, at least one email today. I got a phone call yesterday um, regarding the storm and the potential impact for cleanup in the unincorporated area uh, for discussion for the Board of Supervisors. So that would be something for yeah. an upcoming agenda item. And I've asked Jerry, Jerry's down at EOC and he had done some work before on disposal sites, but um, yeah, we, I know right now um, our secondary roads crews are just really busy trying to get the roads open and get you know, power dealt with. So, and I do have a request, somebody wanted to call and talk about it. We can mind what it's called, but I'm not sure what our, what our resources are right now. No. Jerry's looking into disposal site again. Okay, and I, yeah, I know that a uh, person who called me yesterday, I tried to call him back, but due to the, <laughs> cell, the yeah. it's obviously a cell phone, we could not, we could not get through. Okay, so. Anything else? Lewis? Nothing. No, I think I think I, as we take care of this little housekeeping things on Friday, you know, uh, as far as we've discussed, like a better, a, a further update maybe from the staff about where we are with with the uh, storm, mm -hmm. yeah, et cetera, plus what we uh, for the uh, Hickory Grove paving to move on, and if we have enough data response from the Board of Health, and if we don't. I mean, you know, because it'll just be a response saying, yeah, we'll do it or we won't. That, that's maybe if you guys could meet before then. Yeah. So anyway, so I can't think of anything, you know, having much into Friday then since we, you know, on that. So we still need to have a meeting on Friday because we deferred the resurfacing. Yes. But that is, do we have other agenda items? We deferred two things. The Hickory Grove and oh, the, the DOT. Yeah. The DOT. DOT. That'll be the okay, one that may take some time. Right, so that would be okay. And, and no, so I don't. Beyond that, I'm not aware of what. Right away, I don't have anything in the works. Hey, Linda, those have to be done Friday. Um, the question is, we're trying to figure out how we're going to fund Zoom uh, on Friday. We're we're very limited on staff Friday, so I'm just okay. trying to figure. We can do a conference call on Friday. Yeah, we don't have to do the whole Zoom. I did not think about that. See, yeah. the, the only thing is, we kind of promised Mike that we, we, we said we do it on Friday. Yeah, and the other thing about the, is that um, we should get something to the DOT as soon as possible. Right. Because I think Nevada was supposed to send something. They're, yeah. they're past their deadline now because of. Um, well, what we're doing, <coughs> I just, we're, we're trying behind the scenes to figure out. Sure. Sorry about that. Yeah, I mean, we could. We've done before. Before we had Zoom, we did conference call. So, yeah, yeah well, we would each be on our own computer. Yeah. Is that, we, we, that's what you're talking about, right? No. no. Oh, no, sorry. No, we get back to the old. Uh, oh, just. Got it. Okay, just the yeah. telephone. Yes. Okay. Telephone. Yes. 
Comments from the public on items not on the agenda. Board may not take action now, but may do so in the future. So open public forum number two. Is there anybody who'd like to uh, make any comments? If so, please unmute yourself. Seeing or hearing nobody, I will close public forum number two. We'll go on to liaison assignments, committee meeting updates, and announcements from the supervisors. I do have one thing, and I don't know if I should have, should have been under upcoming agenda items, but it's actually a drainage district meeting. Um, we're having a meeting for Grant 5, Monday, August 24th, 6 p.m., and it has been announced that it's going to be on Zoom. Um, I think you said something, said you thought we should rent it someplace for an in-person meeting. Well, the, the, uh, the drainage district, no, that was on the septic ordinance. Was that the septic yeah, ordinance? Yeah, that was Never the septic then. ordinance. Right. Well, either I'm concerned. I I I've been thinking about that, and I'm really concerned how we manage social distancing. It, yeah, it we'll have to. Huge. I, I think I pointed that would be you know there'll be logistics involved that we need to talk about for the septic one, um, but for the drainage district one, we'll just stay with Zoom. Right? Well, let's stay with Zoom with the drainage district and see how that works. Okay. And because given I think it would be, I think it would be almost prohibitive. I mean, it's, it's a, I'm thinking about all the work that you did when we did that, um, the cable moratorium resolution, and and we didn't have and and, and add social distancing, COVID 19 on top of all that, and it seems pretty daunting to me to try to do an in person meeting with a lot of people. So now to come to the drainage district, though, that DD5, I think, has been maybe the biggest drainage district where, as far as turning out residents over and over again, you know, okay, um, that I've ever attended. And um, my concern about being on Zoom is the same one as bringing up on the septic ordinance is that we're specifically talking about people who, who live in the unincorporated areas and do not have access to reliable broadband. So, so just to, even though we were looking at doing this with Zoom or, you know, they have to do it as a conference call, I just want to point out that we could conceivably have 60 people or more that want to come discuss DD5, especially since the topic is going to be what the annexation down period. And that's the one that's drawn a lot of people in the past um, right on that. So then that does come to moving it maybe to maybe the community building if it's open. Um, and then uh, the issue, you're right, is the social distancing, which means we would have to have some staff who would have to ask. I mean, we would have to be very firm about, yes, come in, I know you're your neighbors, but we're going to ask you to have a mask on if you're going to talk to your neighbors, or just masks are required if you're still going to sit by family groups. You know, really. How do you enforce that? I hate to use this, but how do you enforce that? You say, I think well, I think we can. It's we we are. You don't you don't know who's who lives in one household. No, no, you're right. It's kind of like the honor thing that Paul Rounds, the public health defender, was talking about earlier. But we can say, uh, as far as the mask part, you will wear. Please, you will wear a mask, or we're going to ask you to leave. Okay, but you're right. Can we enforce that? No, we have to trust on that. And then, you know, and say, um, everybody make an announcement about we've asked for it, and we're asking everybody to take responsibility for themselves and their neighbors to keep the safe. Uh, my one question is, I, that was a concern that I had too, is, is the folks that, that um, the ability to call in or zoom in yeah. and stuff. Um, uh, I guess my one question would be, the timetable. Folks have been notified already when and how to 
oh, yes. that's at the yeah. meeting. Mm -hmm. And then they'd have to get in. Would there be some confusion then? Yeah. That would be uh, the other thing yeah, to take into consideration. We've already published the. Yeah. Okay. Good finished. point. Good point. Okay. Yeah, so I don't disagree would... with what you're saying, but we right. this is where we're at in the process. Well, we you definitely know, want You know, we put off the doing the CAFO meeting because we said we needed to have something better than the conference calling system. Right. And we did kind of, and I know it's a different crowd, so to speak, or a different kind of, you know, but but we but we kind of followed that by saying you can submit comments in advance. Please do, we'll acknowledge the comments. You have phone option, you have the Zoom option. I it, it I don't know what I don't know what else. Yeah. I think we've done everything we can short of having an in-person meeting in a very, very large place and spending a whole lot of resources trying to trying to make sure people social distance. So okay. Yeah. Any other comments? <laughs> okay. We decided that's the way we we're going to do it, and we published it, so it would be hard to go back and forth. Um, I don't have anything. I just have a DCAP meeting this Friday and actually got moved to Monday. So, um, yeah, yeah. I don't have anything uh, meeting wise that have changed that have changed around to notify folks. Yeah, I was going to listen in to the city council meeting tonight. Obviously, we won't do that. And uh, we've got the CCMT meeting tomorrow, and Friday morning I have a DC uh, meeting, uh, exec committee meeting, and that I'll, I'll be attending by Zoom. So anyway, uh, that pretty well takes care of it for me. Thank you. Okay. That I move towards adjourn for adjournment. Thank I do. Second. 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 Second.